Good afternoon. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. We are gathering this afternoon to, um, to take a look again at S15. Um, we've, we've had a couple folks suggest um, some amendments that we will look at a little bit later on. Uh, but we've also had um, some requests for more testimony, and I, um, I had reached out to our Secretary of State's office folks this morning to see if they might be able to, uh, I don't know, um, uh, use some connections to find us someone from Oregon. And um, I, I gather that hasn't yet happened, but... Um, uh, Chris, could you just update us on where you are with reaching out to Oregon folks so we know whether we might still expect someone? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State. Um, we had uh, reached out to them uh, early this morning, but of course, they're on a three-hour difference in time, uh, but we still haven't heard anything back yet. I've got the Secretary of State working on it, so as soon as he hears something, I'll be sure to let the, the committee know. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, in the meantime, committee, I hope you've had an opportunity to look at some of the resources that Rep Higley um, had uh, researched and found for us. And we can uh, certainly have some committee discussion about what was contained in those resources um, on the election guide to, uh, to Oregon's election procedures. So um, that was very interesting. Um, First, though, I would like to um, I'd like to ask uh, Amarin if you can share with us the proposed amendments that are uh, sort of on the table, and we can go through the language on those and um, have some committee discussion and some straw polling about what is contained there. So, committee members, your um, your documents under today should have that proposed changes. Is that the title of the document we're looking at? Yes. Okay, super. All right, uh, why don't you take us through this language? Certainly, for the record, Amarin Abergele, Legislative Council. I have in here six proposed changes. Uh, these were, for the most part, all brought up and discussed at least a little bit um, in committee discussion with the exception maybe of the last two, which are two that I added. So for the first proposed change on number one uh, is concerning the voter checklist. This would be a new bill section. Uh, it is not presently in S15. So this would add a section around title 17, section 2154, the statewide voter checklist. And you'll see if you scroll down to the bottom of page one, highlighted in yellow, this would add a new responsibility uh, in statute for the Secretary of State's office to make reasonable efforts to compare the information on the checklist with data or information contained in any state agency's database, a database administered by the federal government or any database of another state or consortium of states where possible in an effort to maintain the accuracy and currency of the checklist. And this is as a result of Representative Gannon's request um, that the section be amended to codify some of the practices that the Secretary of State's office already has in place. And this is the general language um, to describe the ERIC system, is that right? Director Senning, you had spoken to us about cross-referencing um, our voter checklist with other states. Right, and uh, more generally, with uh, Will Senning, Director of Elections, for the record, um, I would say it's, it's broad enough to include both the ERIC activities and other things such as uh, comparing the records to the Department of Health records, death records, and the uh, potentially Social Security Administration records. That's why the reference to federal agencies for the SSA. Um, committee members, questions for um, either for Amarin about the words on the page or for Director Sunning about the uh, about what this means. <laughs> Rep. Leclerc. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Good, good afternoon. Um, Will, how much of what you just said is new compared to what you are currently doing? Almost none, only that by, by our participation in ERIC, we're going to be able to have better comparison against Social Security Administration. Okay, so of all this, the, the ERIC is, is considered new compared to past practice? Yes. Okay, very yep. good, thank you. Rep Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess this question be, would be for Will as well. Um, is, there, is there a timeline on this or is there, is there a time that should be addressed in this as well? How do you mean, Rep Higley? Well, sort it just of a says frequency, make, maybe. Well, just it says make reasonable efforts to compare the information. When, you know, uh, so long prior to uh, election, uh, you know, a year before the election. Um, what what's what's the what's the process now? When when is it when is it looked at? At certain time before the uh, ballots go out. It's a good thought. I, I would read it as that it should be happening on an ongoing basis all of the time. Um, and as of now, it, that is really how it happens, other with the exception that federal law doesn't let you do a systematic review of your checklist within 90 days of a federal election. So that there's kind of a stop when they have to stop doing this kind of activity. Um, but otherwise, they're doing it on an ongoing basis. And I and I realize that you say that it is on an ongoing basis, but should should that be included in this wording? I wouldn't be opposed to that. Make reasonable efforts um, on an ongoing basis, for instance. I just it, to me, it's kind of open ended as far as <clears throat> when it happens, and uh, you know, I I certainly understand that you do it now, but just right. just wondering if that wouldn't tighten it up a little bit, just just no. a thought. And that was the overall intent was to sort of formalize and codify what we do now. So I understand that. Thank you. Rep Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, uh, Eric is a, a, a particular one. How many varieties of these uh, statewide comparison facilities do exist and what's the level of uh, complication that's involved in them. I was under the general impression that uh, when people talked historically about purging, that it was based on John Smith lives in California and also lives in Vegas, so John Smith doesn't vote anymore. Um, do those, are there different gradients of information that is made available to make them more reliable slash accurate slash less punitive? Couple ways I would answer that. To your first question, really, they're the only entity of their kind at this point. There is not any um, comparable effort. There was a predecessor effort known as Crosscheck that was built in Kansas long ago, um, which has essentially been discontinued at this point. And is um, that the, that the mechanism that was being used? Uh, to, to eliminate people as opposed to verify people, I would have to probably characterize it. I don't know that I'd characterize it that way just to want to be completely fair. Um, what I would say is that the reason that it sort of went away is because over time, the member states found the data to not be reliable. So essentially identifying bad matches um, and that has been the opposite with the member states and Eric who find the data to be very reliable and their out matching algorithms to be much stronger. And, and to the second part of your question, it's, um, and it's good because I wanted to touch on it anyway. <laughs> based on law, based on current state and federal law, there will be different actions taken on different parts of the data that we get from Eric. And that is to say that if we get their um, file that identifies folks who have died and or duplicates, those are ones the clerks can act on immediately. But for the two reports, which are really the biggest, most substantive ones for the in-state and out-of-state moves, 
I think, as I said yesterday, actually, all that those will result in is a challenge letter to that voter. You still can't remove simply based on that indication that they may live somewhere else now. Thank you. All right, um, other questions on this first amendment. We had talked about this as a group. Um, we can tighten up the language, I think, a bit to, um, to indicate that this is something that happens in an ongoing basis. All right. So I'm seeing some thumbs up. So let's go ahead and do a straw poll about including this in the bill. Um, people comfortable including proposal number one. All right, great job. Let's go on to number two. All right, proposed change number two, beginning on page two, is about the use of affidavits to cure certain uh, defective ballots. This would amend two sections that are presently in S15, uh, section 13, which you'll see on page two. And if you scroll down to page three, you'll see some new language and some change language in yellow. So first, there was the change of the word postcard to the word notice. And you'll see that in Romanet three and then also in subsection B on page three. Then there is the addition of this sentence in yellow, if the ballot was deemed defective because the voter failed to sign the return certificate or to place the voted ballot in the certificate envelope, the clerk shall include a returnable affidavit designed and provided by the Secretary of State's office with the notice so the voter may cure the deficiency in accordance with subdivision 2547D1C. Moving down on to page Four, you'll see the second section we are we would be amending with this proposed change, section, section 16 of S15. And if you scroll down onto page five, this is the section that was just referenced previously. Uh, and this is a new subdivision C, which is uh, A, B, and C are ways that a voter may cure a defect. Subdivision C says, for a voter who failed to sign the certificate envelope or failed to place the voted ballot in the certificate envelope, returning the signed affidavit included in the notice under subdivision 2546A2B Romanet 3, either by mail, in person, or electronically, provided the affidavit is received by the presiding officer prior to the closing of the polls. And I will note that the term by the presiding officer you see in uh, subdivision B, that is changed language from the previous version in discussion with the Secretary of State's office. Uh, we decided that the, the term by the presiding officer is more accurate. This previously said, uh, provided the new ballot, or in this case, the affidavit also, uh, is received by the town clerk or delivered to the polls by the end of uh, the election day. But really what it needs to be is that it needs to reach the presiding officer uh, prior to the closing of the polls, whether it's delivered to the town's clerk's office, which then has time to bring it to the presiding officer or whether it is brought directly to the polls and uh, gets to the presiding officer before the closing of polls. So we just wanted to make sure that that language was clear. And then in subdivision 2A, you'll see added a reference to this new subdivision C. And those are all of the changes for proposed change two. All right, so before we go to Rep. Pichowski to talk briefly about this, I just wanted to orient Carol Dawes, who um, has joined us, that we are taking a look at proposed amendments to the bill um, that can be found on our committee page under today's date and Amarin's name. Um, and we have straw polled our acceptance for the proposed change number one, and we're now discussing change number two. So uh, Representative Pichowski. Thank you so much. I actually um, was going to ask a question about the presiding officer piece, but I might let Carol Dawes do it instead because I was voicing her concern um, with that being the presiding officer and not any sworn election official. So I would just love to hear, mm. Amber, and I know you got to it a little bit, um, but that was a concern raised in my email about that particular change. 
Yeah, and, um, thank you. Um, Rep. Vahosky actually sent me the, the proposed language and I had an opportunity to review it beforehand. Um, forgive me, I'm by myself in the office today, so I'm dealing with customers uh, and will be popping in and out. Um, my concern with, with specifying presiding officer is that uh, it, it leaves no um, opening for other uh, election officials if the presiding officer happens to be busy at the time. Um, but we do have other sworn election officials um, in the building. And so I don't know whether perhaps presiding officer or their designee or, or something along those lines. I just would, felt that putting just presiding officer was a little too narrow. So Director Senning, do you have um, thoughts or a strong inclination one way or the other on the question of presiding officer or designee or some other term? No, makes makes sense to me and I'd be fine adding either a designee or other sworn election official. The point of the amendment was, Carol, so that people wouldn't be bringing it to the clerk's office at 6 p.m. and expecting it to get acted on. So it was that it needs to make it to the polling place by the end of the polls. And just for everyone else too, any that have been returned throughout the entire 45 day period up until the close of the clerk's office on the day before are gonna be accepted by the clerk and, and brought with or communicated to the presiding officer at the polls. Um, and so then it just says, once you've gone to election day, we don't want people going to the clerk's office and thinking that that um, will be sufficient. So they have to come to the polling place. So in that regard, it would be fine to add election officials to that language. Thank Thanks, you. Carol. Madam Chair, if you want me to orient people to this change, I'm certainly happy to, um, but I'm also happy to let other people ask their questions, whatever is your preference. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and take a first crack at it and then we'll go to questions. Yeah, sure thing. So this um, was a change that I brought up yesterday to um, expand and make the language around um, defective ballot curing a bit more permissive um, for potential future changes, as well as not having the ballot curing process only include people voting again. And it was in response, initially came because I, I know there's other ways that we could possibly explore to cure ballots and track ballots in the future. And then um, Carol Dawes actually also brought up some concerns around the narrowness of the ballot curing process. So that's where that this came from and what its intention is. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question about the, um, on section C there, the electronically getting back the, um, the signed affidavit. So we're talking about actually scanning and submitting the actual affidavit and then it can be received back electronically. I guess that would be the will. <laughs> Right. Yes, Rep. Leclerc. I, I, I saw, I mean, Rep. Vihovsky may want to speak to this too, but I saw two sort of um, goals from including electronically there, just what you say, that it would allow when there's, say, day before the election or day of the election for a scan and an email of that affidavit to work. Um, and also, if we get to a point like we were discussing with Rep. Vihovsky yesterday, where we're using one of the ballot tracking services such as ballot tracks or, or anything like that, um, that have a text communication ability that you could then text your response to the affidavit potentially through that kind of technology. Okay, I'll wait and listen for more. That was certainly my intention was to keep it open for the, that possibility. I know right now, you know, it's I, banks use technology like this, where if I go to make a big purchase that's out of the norm, I get that text message that said, hey, did you do this? This is the fraud department. And I can text back and say yes. And they're like, okay, great go on your way. And I know that the the various, I did some research since yesterday too. And I know that there's three major ballot tracking programs out there that do allow some immediate capacity if you get that alert to respond really quickly, which hopefully would allow for more engagement, more security and less work on our town clerks down the road. And so it was really meant to leave it open for the possibility of employing the many technologies we have at our disposal um, in the future. Director Senning. You know, what I also just thought of too is this will, and this may be the most important, it will allow for um, if I can build it with our current software vendor, 
uh, a response to happen from the My Voter page. So place the affidavit on the page, say electronically signed here. Ooh, fabulous. Other committee questions? All right, temperature check. How are we feeling about the usefulness of including this in the bill? One, two. All right, anybody want to give me a thumbs down? All right, straw poll says we'll move forward with this. So back to you, Amron. Okay, proposed change three is on page six. This is concerning uh, ballots for first time voters. This would amend a bill section that is already in S15, section eight, uh, concerning the delivery of early voter absentee ballots. You'll see if you scroll down to page seven, uh, subdivision B would now read, if a voter registers to vote for the first time in Vermont, following the time when the Secretary of State's office generated the address file to be used for the mailing of ballots to all active voters by the Secretary of State's office, the clerk shall either issue a ballot to the voter in person at the time of registration or mail a ballot to the voter not later than the next business day. And this previously uh, required the, the first time voter to request a ballot. And now a ballot would automatically either be issued to them in person or sent to them by mail. Rep Vyhovsky. I again wanted to hop in, but I'm gonna let Carol do it as well. She made the suggestion that we change that from one business day to three business days. My suggestion had to do with the three business days, thank you. <laughs> the three business days that is allowed in statute for data entering voter registrations. Um, it seemed that it made sense to have them mirror each other. Uh, and actually one other comment that I had is that similar to the, um, to the, uh, the deadline with regards to um, curing defective ballots where it says that we don't have to send the postcards during the five days preceding the election, um, that perhaps a uh, similar language should be added here that we would not mail absentee ballots out in the five days preceding the election um, associated with when someone registers a new voter registration. That makes logical sense to me. Uh, Will Senning, thoughts on from your perspective on that? I would be fine with both of those amendments. Both make sense to me, Carol. Okay. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Carol and Will. That, that's exactly what I was gonna ask, <clears throat> whether there was a uh, do not send window, just because if it were stuck in the mail, it would create, again, unanticipated problems because um, neither party would know it was coming or arrived or hadn't arrived. My point is, is five days enough, given the USPS, for it to get there upon request? <clears throat> Carol? I think five days is adequate. We actually will mail absentee ballots out um, until the Thursday or Friday before elections. We make sure to tell people, um, you know, that it needs to be returned to us by uh, close of polls and frequently people will then hand deliver them on election day. Um, but I think five days is, is a good number. All right, uh, Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Will, is, um, is there always going to be those ballots in the, in the town clerk's office at that time? Uh, again, I just, I'm trying to figure out the time frame here. Um, Secretary of State's office generated the address file to be used. Um, and then if it's after that time, uh, the clerk shall either issue a ballot. And I uh, are those ballots uh, always going to be there for the town clerk at that time to issue one personally? That's a good thought, Rep Higley. Um, I think there's probably about a week period there where they may not have received the ballots yet. 
And I think we can address that with language that appears other places in the statute that will essentially say, um, that will account for that. That will say they only need to do that at, at such time as they have the ballot. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rep Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we've touched around this issue a lot, but you know, we, we say mail for the postcards and a lot of other stuff. I think we learned this election cycle that mail is not necessarily a concrete sort of concept. Uh, should there be something that allows a new technology or something that could come in without coming back here? And if we can't send a ballot, but you could certainly send a postcard or some other thing by electronic means if you had that available. Just an idle thought. Do you, are you directing that question at anyone in particular? Well, I suppose it would go to Will to say, what about the future, maybe? You know, at some point, the state of Vermont is going to have a My Voter page that has everybody in the state an email address assigned. Uh, do we do communications through that, then relying upon the post office for something like your, your ballot is spoiled or some other communique? And it's, at this point, just food for thought, I suppose. I understand the thought. I, for one, hope that we have some form of functioning mail service into the pretty indefinite future, but I hear what you're saying. Um, but we discussed that a lot in the Senate as well about the method of um, delivering the notice. And the, and the consensus was that the fairest way and the, the information that we have for every individual in this situation is a mailing address. Um, and that's why to make that the baseline and then to allow for the clerk to do other forms of notice. All right, thanks. Representative Yehovsky. That was really just gonna be my thought. That was really the what I was trying to get at with, with the previous thing is just allowing for the other opportunities but not necessarily mandating it. Cause we don't, we don't I, I think there's predictions about where we might go in the future but we certainly don't know. So I do love the idea of just allowing for other potentially electronic options. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Manchin. So where you say notice will is the understanding that it's gonna at least be a postcard, but what I'm getting at is where uh, the representative from Burlington is coming from. Let's say that I had a good address. I was a town clerk and I had a good email address for a voter. Couldn't I just send along an email with that affidavit and not have to send the postcard? Would that be acceptable? I'm scrolling back up to the to the language. Um, I'm on page. Oh, but I'm in the three. changes. No, but it doesn't have the, the, the basic language about the initial contact. I got to get back to the bill itself. Oh, sorry. Just a second. Or somebody can help me out too. I think it allows for the clerk to use other means. So when I'm looking, particularly in the defective ballot section, it says not later than the next day by mail. So I wonder if we could say send instead of mail, which would allow for mail or electronic. Like, I wonder if we can just change mail to send. Or redefine mail or potentially redefine mail, but I do see that it is specific that it is mail a notice. Because I mean, along with that that thought process, if, if they can email you back the affidavit, then what would be the harm in emailing it to them? I agree. Oh my goodness, Tonya. <laughs> so how about deliver? Sure. Okay. Recent I mean, state. without going too deep here, I mean, I've signed a lot of legal documents through this thing called DocuSign. Is, is that a viable option for 
something along those lines? That is up to you to decide. Well. <laughs> I think that was a punt. <laughs> I mean, is that is that a viable alternative? I mean, is there do you have the capability and I guess the the latitude and authority to use something like that? I believe the Electronic Signatures Act would allow for it also, which Vermont is um, pursuant to. I would be curious if Carol has any thoughts on this discussion right now, because she was deeply involved too in the Senate discussion about what was the best baseline way to provide this notice. Okay. The, the biggest concern that, that we had was just making sure that whatever is done is equitable and is being applied across the board. Yeah. Um, if I have an email address for half of my uh, registered voters, but don't have it for the other half, um, so how do I, do I make sure that I send half of them email and half of them a, a, a notice, a written notice? Is that really equitable? Is it, is it easier or more equitable to send everybody the same format? Um, we certainly wanted to make sure that whatever we were doing was going to cover everybody the same way or whether it was different delivery options, you know, that would be possible, but, but we just wanted to make sure we weren't missing people or or didn't want there to be the appearance of like cherry picking people based on the information we had. I guess I would look at that a bit differently that if you have the information for people, let's say, you know, because yeah, the concern about this is is if, if you have a ballot and I live locally, then you can send me a postcard and then I can come in and resolve it that way. But if I live out of state, and say your first contact with me is via an email, it could be almost instantaneous and we could resolve it within a, fat, a matter of a few minutes even. The other um, challenge that, that plays into this is how deeply are clerks going to go into exploring what they have for different contact information or ways per voter? Um, you know, are we going to have to search our email um, inboxes to see if we've got an email for somebody? It, is that going to be expected? Um, having the option to look at different ways of reaching out to people um, is great. But if the expectation is that I'm going to do everything that I, you know, I'm going to search the online white pages, I'm going to have, you know, it just, I think you, you create a, a, a an unnecessary burden to, to clerks to, to say, you know, that we would exhaust all opportunities right. to, to contact people. No, I get that. I'm not advocating for that, but I would much prefer to give you the option yes. where you don't have to send the postcard if electronically or smoke signals works better, then do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're, Com comfortable with the concept of sending notice. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Representative Anthony. I just was searching <clears throat> as per Will and Tanya and Bob for a general term and I came to the conclusion that transmit was probably as good as it gets because you could transmit by mail, electronically, uh, smokes, uh, smoke signals, whatever you want. Um, and by rule, then, the uh, elections division can figure out as technology evolves how, in essence, it wants to flesh out the meaning of transmit. Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to say I think it's important that we keep this as flexible as possible because the one reality we haven't really touched on is the uh, digital divide. And it really impacts, I think uh, a year ago, state officials estimated about 60,000 residences have no internet or very poor internet. So we just can't think electronic. Yeah. Thank you. Good point. Rep Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was part of my, um, my fear is is that just, you know, relying on that, sometimes people could go days or weeks without checking their email or just don't have service at all. 
Um, and I was just going to ask uh, Miss Dow's, you know, if she felt comfortable at that, she thought it, there was fairness by leaving that open, or if she thought that clerks were going to start to feel they had to pick over one another, but she kind of cleared that up herself. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that we are being clear and, um, you know, it's, it's frustrating for me that you got, you know, that clerk, to me, clerks should not be required to have to contact voters through data you guys might not have obtained. Like you guys do have mailing addresses, but the rest is in lingo if you, you limbo, if you have it, you might not have a phone number, you might not have email, but you do have a mailing address. Um, so to me, it, it'd be a little frustrating to require you to contact them through a way that you might not have the data about. Um, but again, you clarified that. So I was just looking to see if you were comfortable with the language we were changing um, for your position. Thank yes. you. Yep. As long as it's as it's uh, allowing different opportunities, you know that I think that makes the most sense. Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Anthony, we landed on the same word. Uh, as a matter of response to Carol's question about where do I have to, how much do I have to do, um, the town clerks have access to the information on the My Voter page? Yes. So that's sort of the authoritative source to some degree. Thanks. All right. Are we feeling ready for a decision? And moving on. Could I could I ask a clarifying question, Madam Chair? Yes. Absolutely. I just wanted to make sure I understand where people are landing in terms of exact terms here. There's been discussion of um, what's currently in Romanet three on page. Let's see what page is this? Page twenty um, of the bill itself, um, and I believe it's page three in the proposed changes. Is uh, it currently says mail a notice. Uh, designed and provided by the Secretary of State's office to the voter at the address where the ballot was sent. Um, and so my question is, are we changing this to deliver? Um, I also heard transmit and I also heard send. So I was wondering whether people had a preference between those terms and also whether um, whether the committee is comfortable with saying something like send a notice informing the voter um, and then leave it up to the Secretary of State's office to provide you know, guidance to clerks as to what those options may be. Will, does that seem to make sense to you that? It does, but you're watching the wheels turn in my head as much as they can to try and remember. We had a very similar discussion over in the Senate, and I know that that doesn't have any bearing on what we're doing here now, but it's because it's an important issue and it's there's um, there's a lot to think about when you're thinking about it. And I'm trying to remember why we decided that it really was best to have a baseline requirement to send the postcard. One thing I would point out is just keep it in context. There's the paragraph below makes really clear that once again, when you're within five days of the election, they're not required to send a postcard and then specifically says they can use other means to contact a voter. Anytime earlier than that, there's, I hate to say it, but there's not a big rush, right? You can, you can send this postcard, it can get to where it needs to go in a couple of days, and then the voter has all of these different methods to respond to it through the voter page or electronically or send the affidavit back. Um, and the idea was picturing the clerks sitting at their desk in their office, processing the ballots that have come in that day in a stack, say, next to them. They're sitting there with the ballot. They determine it's defective. They've got the envelope it came in with the return address right there. They've got a little stack of postcards on their desk. They pick one off of it, fill in that return address and drop it in the outbox that's on the other side of the desk. As opposed to looking up the voter in VEMS, seeing if there is an email or phone number, sending an email that may or may not be looked at for the next week. I have stopped looking at my Gmail on any regular basis, my wife, hammers me about it because I do still get important stuff in my Gmail. Um, that was the discussion that went on. But sitting here now, I can't really think of why it would hurt to, to, to have it be an option for the clerk to look up a different mode of contact. Um, and if Carol's comfortable with that too, I think I would be. 
I think, and Will, you would know better with regards to the, the vendor for VEMS, um, if there was a way um, as we're, you know, if I'm data entering something as defective into the system, if there's a way to then click into a, a you know, an email. Send email. Or that, yeah, send email to that voter. I mean, the, the information is all contained in there. That certainly would be um, a, a, an easy way to incorporate um, email as an option. It's true. And I think that would be doable, Carol. And we're requiring you to go in and enter them as defective now within the three days. So, yeah. yep. I, I think I'm okay with it, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, Amarin, does that give you the clarity that you need? I believe so. I think what we're looking at now is send a notice. And I will transmit. Tran transmit. Sorry. What's that? <laughs> Why use <laughs> one Almost syllable when you can use two syllables? <laughs> <laughs> when I first came to the legislature, I, I had this sneaking suspicion that legislative council got paid by the word <laughs> because it always seemed like no matter what we were doing, there was words being added all over the place. <laughs> the more obscure, the better. So, Amarin, I will leave that to your discretion. Um, I think transmit and send seem to mean the same thing to us. And um, you can see what you think fits as you're doing the redraft. Uh, Rep. Yep. I, sorry. No, Will, go ahead. Mine is on a slightly different, my question's on a slightly different topic. So I want to finish this one first. I'm remembering, and it's just important for you guys to consider, I think, uh, part of the part of the discussion was when you're talking about emails and especially phone calls. When do you, what do you consider as having effectively communicated uh, through those means? So does leaving a voicemail count? Do they have to keep trying if they've left a voicemail and haven't heard back from the voter? Um, you can't tell whether an email's been read or not. Is just the simple act act of the clerk hitting send sufficient? Um, and that's where it was all of those questions, I think, that came back to, you know, why don't we make sure everybody gets a postcard sent to them? That, that was part of it. So if I could be clear about the legislative intent and be able to train my clerks as such, it would be nice to know that the intent was a phone call and a vo one phone call and a voicemail does it. What if they don't have voicemail, like me at my house right now, again, comparing my own life? Um, or in his sent his is hitting send on the best known email you have, whether that may be out of date now or not um, sufficient. Whereas the mailing address on the return envelope, you know, just effectively transmitted a ballot to that voter at that address. Anyone want to weigh in and offer an opinion on that? Rep. Hosky, are you on this or are you on something else? Both, but I can weigh in on this too. <laughs> yeah, go, go right ahead. Your hand is up and we'll get back to you on the other. Um, I mean, my intent here really is to leave op an openness. And if the, the clerks want to mail a postcard, fine. It's it's that attempt to make contact. I really just, I, as we're thinking about potentially having a My Voter page that could do this all within the My Voter page, I don't want to have to come back and change it as things shift and change. Yeah. yeah. Just to allow for, but no, mm -hmm. I think it should be on our clerks to call a voter every day. If they've left a message, they've left a message. Um, you know, there is a level, I, I don't want to see our clerks having to do that or having to send 27 emails until someone gets back to them. I think that that you know in the same way that you wouldn't go to their house if you didn't hear back from them from the postcard like you would send it and assume that they got it yeah uh rep leclerc um again i think i have a tendency to agree with a member from essex here in that um i don't know that sending a postcard gives you any more assurance than sure leaving a voice message or sending an email and having it come back and tell you that the sender isn't there. Um, and as a former UPS person talking about service levels, I'm not sure that I have a lot of confidence in the post office as far as getting stuff anywhere timely these days. And 
I still go back to, I think we give the town clerks the option because I'm sure Carol knows a lot about her constituents as far as who's around in the winter time and who isn't. And, you know, she may make that choice knowing that somebody is out of state and a postcard won't get there, but she may have a current email address or access to one. And I just, I just think if we give them the option, um, I believe that they will make this thing work and not cause any additional burden. I think that's reasonable and ultimately that it's probably advisable to leave the options open for the future too. All right, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just like to um, echo that I, I do have, well, many concerns, but just one of, you know, how do you know that you have reached the voter? Um, you know, the same rem remarks that Representative Claire has said, you know, you can send an email that might not work. You can send the postcard right back. Um, but, you know, having the control of that option as local as it can be down to the town clerk, I think we've found that that has been the most accurate, you know, even doing that for town meeting day and legislations that we have passed, you know, they made their decisions that worked best for their office. Um, and I, you know, I trust them enough to make the, the better judgment of what they're going to need. So not forcing anything, but giving them the options, um, I would feel more comfortable with. Uh, Rep. Kuchowski. I just want to make sure we're done with this conversation before I take us to a new one. <laughs> okay. My question around the ballot curing, um, and I apologize if I missed it or misread it, but one of the things that's come up repeatedly that creates a defective ballot that we saw a lot in the primary was not all three um, ballots being primary ballots being returned. And I'm wondering if in the way the language is written, signing an affidavit that you didn't vote on those is an acceptable cure for that? And if not, if we can have a little conversation. All right, so from an elections administration perspective, uh, Will, do you have an opinion on affirming? Never that? understood why not returning those two ballots makes it defective in the first place. Um, so I would be comfortable with that. Uh, Carol Dawes from a clerk's perspective. I, whoops, sorry. Um, the, uh, uh, from a clerk's perspective, I, I think of two things, not returning the two unvoted ballots. I can, I can see being able to, to cure that through an affidavit. What happens for us more often is that we get multiple voted ballots. Um, and I don't see how that could be cured through, uh, through an affidavit process, um, but just something, because usually the reason we don't get two uh, unvoted ballots back is that they've decided to vote all of them or more than one, so. <laughs> well, that creates a bit of a problem now, doesn't it? You can't it? tell me, you can't limit me. <laughs> I want to vote everything. <laughs> It's ranked choice voting, isn't it? <laughs> that I was told to vote by... early and vote often. So just as a follow-up, so yes, it would be okay to cure by affidavit if only one is returned. Would If you see that all three are voted and said you can't do this, do you want to pick one and vote again? Would that be a, an acceptable cure process for that? Or are we just saying that's too, like, that's, we're, that's too far? I'm just trying to figure out where we land here. My concern is if you get if you get that far into it, you're now looking at somebody's voted ballot. Mm -hmm. You know, when I get the ballots and I, I, I examine the ballot as little as possible to determine whether it's been voted, whether it's defective or not, because I don't want, nor should I know how a person voted, so. That seems fair to me. Representative Anthony. I'm back at the beginning. It seems like we're adding layers of potential problems. Why are we instructing people to return anything but one ballot that they voted? And if they return more or less, it's defective. But at least we're making the initial attempt in the instructions to make it as simple as possible and eliminate or reduce the number of defects. 
committee discussion on that point? Repihovsky? As the person who has a lot of thoughts on ballot curing, um, I don't I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. I just want to make it so as many people's votes that should that should be counted are counted. So if it's eliminating the process at the beginning, fine. If it's signing an affidavit to cure it on the other end, fine. I don't really have a strong feeling one way or the other. What I'm thinking about to fill the void here. Um, it's as Carol, since Carol mentioned, and I think she's correct, that what we most often see is the, the case of multiple voted ballots, then that's not an explicit defective reason, but it's um, the one that we've always put it in is, well, you didn't return to unvoted ballots in the unvoted primary envelope. Um, but I'm wonder. I'm I'm trying to envision the language in the affidavit that would allow for that cure, and it would kind of have to be unique language to that situation that would essentially allow the voter to tell the clerk which ballot they intend to cast and which two should be the unvoted that that the clerk is sitting there with. Um, and even that gets a little a little messy in terms of what Carol was talking about in terms of looking at the the two ballots. Um, and so I think it's probably the cleaner approach in that case to send them a new packet and say only vote one of these and return the two unvoted in the unvoted ballot. And I know that presents the difficulties we talked about with voters who are further away and may not have time to do that. Um, but I think that's a best is the enemy of the good situation, like I've said before, keeping in mind that we're starting from a place where you can't correct your ballots at all. Um, we're addressing most of the scenarios you can think of um, to allow people to make those corrections. Other committee discussion on that? <clears throat> uh, Representative Gannon. Well, what Director Sunning said makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I think that's the way to do it based on what Carl said of not wanting to look at, at the ballots too closely. Um, just require them to, to vote again, but only one ballot this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would assume most people know that they're only supposed to vote on one ballot. I, I mean, so somebody <laughs> sort of bending the rules a bit to, to submit three, three ballots. So Carol, how often does that happen? Well, <laughs> for Berry City, for the August primary, 10% of our absentee ballots came back as defective, over 100 of them. Um, and I would say that the that eighty percent of those were it fell into that category. It happens all the time, and I have fights on the phone with voters who are you cannot tell me you cannot limit me. I will vote who I want to vote for. That's what it is. And and they and I try to explain to them this is a primary. It's a different animal. You you know you can only vote in one primary in November. You'll be able to vote for whomever you want, whatever party combination you want. But they they don't understand that it's the only election that they have to make this limitation for themselves, and they don't like it. <laughs> uh, Rep. Helsky. Yeah, I, I would say that in my experience, it is not correct to assume that people know that they cannot vote in all three primaries. <laughs> I think we we need to, this is a whole different can of worms about how we need to do better at educating people about how, how the process works. I am perfectly fine with the idea that if th multiple ballots were voted on, revoting being the process, but I would like to find language that would allow for a single, pr if only one is returned, for that to be accepted or curable by affidavit, because I think these are two different situations. And I certainly know of a handful of, of voters in my district that that did happen to them, that they ripped up and destroyed the other ballots. They only returned the one they voted on and then their vote wasn't counted. So I, I do think that these are different animals and should be approached in different ways. Rep. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, a concern of mine is while these are all different animals of their own nature, the biggest one being that uh, I'm fearful that the accountability of a voter is going to be gone, you know, going to be uh, lessened. It, this is a big responsibility that people have, and it's an honor that we, you know, we are in a situation where we can cast a vote and voice our vote for who we, we want. And when you go and, um, you know, people, there are instructions. The instructions are clearly written on what we are supposed to do. And I know we have heard testimony that maybe we need to make the instructions more um, accessible for those that, you know, have different languages and read different, read in different languages. And I, I support that. But I mean, how many times are you going to let somebody make a mistake on something where, you know, the phone number for your town clerk is accessible. If you have questions regarding how to fill out your ballot, you can talk with your town clerk of, oh, is this the one where I fill out one? Is this the one where I fill out two? If, you know, I know some people struggle with reading and some people struggle with instruction, but there are there, there, there are JPs that it can help you. Um, so I definitely feel that the voter accountability, um, that some ownership you need to take upon yourself as well. <laughs> Representative Anthony. I deeply apologize for being repetitive, but nobody has explained to me why the uh, Secretary of State's office or elections needs three ballots back. Filled out or not filled out. Cool. Go ahead, Will. Sorry, Rep Representative Anthony, because it's in the law is my my honest and only answer to that. It's so, <laughs> well, you, that's what we're talking about. But so my response to you was going to be what you are suggesting would require a much more fundamental change to the law in a number of different sections. Oh, okay. And, and would has been discussed before, and for whatever reason is not an easy discussion. Okay. So in the context of this bill, I would love for us to be driving towards um, a common understanding of what form of defect on the primary ballot related to those three ballots we want to um, designate as curable and how that can be cured. So uh, that's what I'm hoping we can uh, come together around. And uh, so we'll continue talking about this. Uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, quickly, I sort of agree with Representative Anthony, that it, although it does help our recycling efforts, I'm sure uh, it, we should deal with that at some point. Uh, Rep. Vihosky is is correct. I think if you get a ballot back, deal with that ballot. The, the number of calls that I got from people saying, why did they send me three ballots? They know I'm a this party member uh, was mystifying and none of them had read the instructions. Smart people, I know how to vote. I'm not bothering to read the instructions. That was the problem. Um, so maybe that's something that gets taken care of, you know, sort of at your level, Will, where it says just vote one ballot, a big black indication across the top. But it, it was amazing to me, the number of people that I considered to be very intelligent that didn't bother to read the place tab A and tab B thing. I just want to say that it is a right to vote, whether you can read or follow instructions or have the executive functioning to be able to remember to return three ballots. It is a right protected by our constitution to vote. And I think we need to be doing everything within our power to make sure people's votes count. And again, I come back to if a one ballot is returned and the others are not, it should be curable by affidavit. And if people have voted on multiple ballots, we should offer them the opportunity to redo it on one and be done with it. It is in the law that people can only, in this proposal of law that people can only cure a ballot, I think twice. So it is not open-ended that they can do it as many times as they want, but it is a right that people can vote regardless of their ability to follow directions, read the laws or, or remember to return all the ballots. And we need to protect that right. Can we agree that uh, that if a voter returns only one primary ballot, that they can cure that by affidavit? I'm seeing some nodding, some thumbs ups. I see a majority of the committee. Um, can we agree that um, if all three ballots are uh, are 
filled out that the voter gets a notification that they need to come in and vote again or receive another batch in the mail and give it a second shot. One, two, three. All right, so Representative Anthony, you're not voting. Does that mean you're a, a no? I'm, I've sort of reached the outer boundary of personal responsibility and workload of the clerks. If they send big fat envelopes of three, which I've been convinced can't happen because in quotes, the law needs to change, then we're gonna send it twice. Uh, you know, it's just piling on, um, if you like, multiple layers of problems. So okay. I, 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 give, I tell them to come in. If they can't come in or don't come in, it's defective. Rep Hooper. Well, I've just been dancing around the, the issue. It takes five days for me to get a birthday card from Burlington, Vermont to Altoona, Pennsylvania. I don't know how long it would take for a military person that's living in Waco. So that five day window sort of bothers me. And I think we're legitimately focusing on people that are living in town. But as uh, the representative from Barry said, there are a lot of Vermonters that go south for the winter too, and it's just as big a problem. So we have no cure for it right now, but that mail back and forth scheme is not necessarily the best one either. Well, did you wanna add anything to that? I Generally, know. I would say, I think uh, if Carol is okay with that approach, I would be, she just probably had to step away to a customer. It makes me a little uncomfortable to make a distinction in how we're treating um, certain ballots that isn't, that isn't in the defective law itself. There's no difference in the law between returning just one um, or returning multiple voted. The law only says that, you, just like I said, that the two unvoted need to be in the envelope. And in any case where that's not the case, it's defective. Um, that would be probably a, some difficult training and, it's, and it, it leads to a lot of questions from the clerks who get anything else other than a single voted ballot back from the primary. Um, but I think if um, I'm envisioning a clause in that same section where it says you can cure the, the two instances that you can cure by affidavit, comma, or in the case of where only a single ballot is returned, like Madam Chair said in the primary, um, that that could be cured by the affidavit as well. I think I'd be okay with that. It makes me a little a little nervous in terms of confusion on the clerk's part, like was just said um, by Rep. Hooper, to make that distinction themselves um, and to, to treat those sort of very similar situations differently. Rep. Dihovsky? Yo, um, well, I am sort of going back to something you said earlier about sort of crafting an affidavit statement that would allow someone who had voted three to say count that one as an option because my understanding in the way that we're crafting this is that someone could cure it by affidavit or could say no i'm going to come back in and revote so if does that feel more comfortable to you to craft that affidavit statement as a way of saying they can by affidavit say yes, I got rid of the other two, or please count this one and get rid of the other two. Does that feel better or less confusing? Like, I, I'm not trying to be a pain. I'm just trying to count as many votes as possible. I'm not sure. I, it's, I have to think about how these affidavits would be structured a little more. So Carol, um, we are still trying to understand the most user-friendly and acceptable way of um, curing a couple of kinds of defects you might see in a primary, either not returning unvoted or uh, erroneously uh, filling out all three ballots. Yeah, I, I think the I think being able to cure by um, affidavit uh, online um, option, the the fact that we did not get the the two um, unvoted ballots, I think that makes perfect sense. I, I I 
can't quite wrap my head around what the best way to deal with, uh, you know, multiple voted ballots is short of um, sending a new packet of ballots. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what, you know, what other, it, to me, if we, if it gets more complicated than that, it, it then becomes, I can imagine, a, a, I can imagine phone conversations with voters, uh, you know, which ones did I vote? Which ones did I, you which know, one which has ones Joe Smith on it? Cause I really like Joe Smith. Yeah, yes, exactly. That being a, um, <laughs> the kind of conversation we might have. Right. Yeah. Uh, Representative Anthony. Maybe the answer is obvious and I just, I, I missed it, but uh, I know from what Will said, obviously the obligation to send three he's saying is a complicated removal, uh, is a definition of defect also embedded uh, such that you couldn't excise the failure to return three and not call that a defect. And so, frankly, when somebody sends one voted, it's not a defect. I don't know where they are in the statutes, so I don't know whether this is parallel complications, sending out versus accepting back. Am, am I making myself clear? The reasons that a ballot is defective are certainly in the, the statute. They're actually in the section we're talking about amending. And you could do what you suggested, Rep. Anthony, um, say that it is no longer a reason for a ballot to be defective if you don't return the two unvoted ones. I, I think that would raise a lot of um, discussion about other issues that people have with that. Well, I, yeah, I... I understand the sort of the history of the collision between trying to be anonymous versus party registration, but there's, we've, we've got a hybrid system and we keep trying to cure it and we're creating the necessity for affidavits and all the stuff we've just talked about. And, you know, we either live with it or we go one way or the other, um, party registration or not. <laughs> Well, I would love for us to be able to put that question to bed once and for all, but um, that's not going to happen on a Friday afternoon. No, not today. <laughs> so that's 15. So um, let's see if we can focus in on, uh, on what level of ballot curing we want to uh, add here for the primary. If, if I may, if Will's willing to do it, I think that at least eliminates one of the, why should we send an at affidavit? Because then... The question boils down to how do you want to cure uh, if someone has sent multiple filled out ballots? If there's only one filled out, you simply trash the other two and there's no defect. It's only in the situation where there are multiple ballots that are filled out that you get into this discussion. Okay, hold that thought. Representative Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Will, um, Carol mentioned that 10% of the ballots were deemed effective. What does that number look like statewide? I think we found it was around six in the primary. Isn't that right, Chris? For the primary, the general being much lower. Okay. And it's because of this three ballot issue that you see that yeah, increased yeah. issues in the primary. Oh, well, it would seem like sending out a new packet may not be such a tall order if there's only, what was it, 3% statewide, you said? Six. Oh, six, okay. Yeah. And just trying to keep it simple. Just while people are thinking about it, the other issue, Rep. Anthony, it's not, it's not only the um, party registration debate, which is certainly the, the fundamental kind of issue that that will raise, but just the simple solution that you're talking about, which is to make it um, not defective if the two unvoted ballots do not come back. That's sort of the easy fix in the defective section you were talking about. Unfortunately, what that raises is fraud concerns about um, the two unvoted ballots that are left behind. But don't they have to come back in a signed sealed envelope? And so you're back to those the same. Aren't, those aren't my together. concerns, but other people's. Okay. Just to clarify, if I may, on, on Will's testimony, he was remembering 
numbers. I just got a, a note that it was uh, 6,000 uh, total, but about 3%. Oh, thank you. For defective ballots for the August primary. Rep Vyhovsky. Um, so it's, I just wanted to check in with Carol because it sounds like what I hear you saying is what's the least complicated for you is to have an affidavit if one is returned and mail a new packet if three are returned voted, that that is actually the least complicated for you. And Will, I heard you say you're okay with that but are worried about it being complicated for the clerks. Spot on because we're getting into a place where it's, I did, Carol, I'm imagining the clerks, I take all the calls. So which are the three reasons that I can accept an affidavit for and which are the reasons I can't and but that's my job. So if, if that's what makes sense to the committee and the clerks are comfortable with it. Uh, and I, go ahead, Carol. I, I was going to say, you know, I'm imagining whatever the notice is or whatever is, um, is available to us through VEMS really very clearly identifies these are the things that are curable by mail a ballot. These are the cure things that are curable by affidavit that, you know, so that hopefully yeah. there, except for the learning curve, there wouldn't be that repetitive bunch of questions. Okay. Does anyone have concerns about that? All right. So, Rep. Dehoski, you are you? Is your hand still up on? If we're good with that, thing? my second question is irrelevant because it was around not returning the other ballots, and if they're barcoded, wouldn't we be able to see if someone had already like that barcode is to a person? So, if every ballot is barcoded and a second ballot comes in with the same barcode, wouldn't we immediately be flagged that they've already voted? I think but, we would still need an affidavit for that. No, but my point, it's the fraud concern. So if we may change the law and said only one, you only have to return one and all of them are barcoded, the, it would, but if we're agreeing affidavit and revote, then it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. So I don't wanna go there. <laughs> I, I take it back. Right, and, and you know, the exit checklist has to match the number of voted ballots total anyway. And so there are other ways of indicating if somebody were to try to fraudulently um, cast one of my unvoted ballots. But, um, but it, as I've said before that, you know, this whole question of one ballot versus three ballots is a, is a much bigger conversation. And I'd rather see if we can just focus on the definition of defective and how we cure. So Representative LeClaire. Wonderful. I'm just, um, could somebody tell me where we're winding up here? Because I'm a little confused on who's on first and who's on second. <laughs> I think where, where we're ending up is that if a voter accidentally returns only one voted primary ballot, that mm -hmm. they will need to cure that by affidavit. Mm -hmm. And if the voter returns all three ballots, voted or more than one ballot voted or uh, some other combination of putting the three ballots in the wrong place, that that will, will uh, trigger a, a revote, a new packet being provided. Okay, and so from Will's perspective and Carol's, that is doable. Okay. I just didn't want to get a lot of correspondence from a lot of clerks that are unhappy. <laughs> oh, don't worry, they're all going to call Will first, <laughs> which I think is why he's trying very hard to, to keep us uh, focused on what is, uh, you know, what is the most streamlined way of accomplishing this. So I appreciate your perspective on that. And Carol, I appreciate you uh, being here for all of this. Uh, Rip Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like the question to Representative Vihoski's um, answer to her question. So all of the all of the ballots we are sent are barcoded, and so if someone only sent in one and someone grabbed the other two and sent them in and they were scanned, wouldn't we have a flag of oh, this person's already voted? That is a question that either Carol or Will would have to answer. 
it's not the ballots themselves that are barcoded. Um, yeah, it's yeah. the envelopes that are barcoded. Um, so the the return envelope that comes from the voter um, has the barcode on it, not the individual ballots. Is there a way to change that? Uh, if you barcoded the the ballot, you would now know who voted the ballot. You don't want to do that. Yeah. I I understand. I understand that. But is there a way to do it to have it go back but not tell you? Is there a way for is there a way for in your system for it to go back and to tell you that I'm sorry, like this has already been used? Like, you know, you try to do, do create a username for something and they say somebody else already has this username. Is there a way to say somebody somebody's already voted through this account? Like keeping it anonymous, not pulling up that, you know, Joe Smith um, from you know, Smith Street voted, but that someone's already voted that is attached to this. So I could imagine that we could think of ways to um, to develop a, a technology that that simply puts a, a unique um, stamp on all three ballots so that if you have processed the progressive primary ballot, the other two matching ballots can't be, uh, can't be read, but, but I don't believe that we have that technology within the system that we're using right now. And I also worry that we're getting uh, lost a little bit in the weeds on this because we do have a bit of uh, an agreement, I think, here between our um, elections officials on how to move forward with curing these. So I, I would like to be able to put those larger questions of how to eliminate the annoyance of three primary ballots needing to go out and come back into another conversation on another day in another year, <laughs> because we're not gonna get to that right now. Um, Thank you. Will, is, is there with, anyone who has figured out how to, how, are there other states that, that do primaries this way and have they figured out a different way to do this? Do you know offhand? I've never heard of that kind of tracking system. We're pretty unique in the way we do the primary. There are a few others, I think, who, who similarly send multiple ballots to single voters. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I've never heard of that. Great. Um, so we have a hand raised from uh, a, a rep from the Vote at Home Institute. So Audrey Klein, do you have information to enlighten us on this question? Hello, ma'am. Thank you, um, Audrey Klein from the National Vote at Home Institute for the record. Um, just to the question on primary ballots um, here in Colorado, unaffiliated voters are actually sent um, both the Republican and the Democratic ballots. Um, the important piece to understand is that when a voter is getting credit um, for this interaction, um, the, the ballot and the envelope work in tandem. So uh, the envelope is what identifies the voter and you get the vote credit for that. And then the ballot is separate. So um, if you get something back with two voted ballots, similar situation here, um, th that is rejected. Um, so I actually, here on my desk somewhere, I have my wife's primary ballot from last year. Um, so if this were to show up uh, at the clerk's office in a regular envelope or in a drop box or a ballot box of some kind, because it is not um, associated with the envelope that identifies her and the barcode that is also assi uh, assigned to her, um, it will not be counted. There is no way to, um, to sort of have a ballot and the, the voter identified at the same time. So there's, um, that is the security process um, that is used in other states that have a similar uh, sort of setup. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. So committee, um, we, uh, I think the instructions that we are leaning towards giving Amarin are around um, single ballot can be, um, corrected by an affidavit swearing that they did not execute the other two ballots and um, multiple ballots need to start over from scratch. Are we, are we in agreement that that's what we're working towards? 
Anybody want to scream? Oh. No, that's not what I wanted. I'll go for it. I just thought the Colorado solution solved the fraud problem, but maybe I didn't, I missed something. All right. Um, Amron, let's look at proposed change number three. I believe we're down to number four. 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 Excellent. We're cruising. All right. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Four. <laughs> I, I, I scrolled back up because somebody asked a question about something higher up on there. So, I yeah. did too. Uh, proposed change four, which is on page seven, uh, would add a new bill section to S15, amending uh, section 2531 of Title 17, application for early voter absentee ballot. If you scroll down to page eight, You'll see some new highlighted language. This would add a subsection D entitled permanent absentee ballot list. The town clerk shall maintain and regularly update a list of qualified voters who have applied to receive absentee ballots for any election in accordance with subsections A and B of this section. Moving on to page eight, a voter who wishes to automatically receive an absentee ballot for each presidential primary and state primary election without making an annual application may apply to be on the permanent absentee ballot list for those elections by so noting on his or her application for an early absentee ballot filed in accordance with the application requirements in subsection A and B of this section. In each presidential primary and state primary primary election, the Secretary of State's office or town clerk as applicable shall mail an absentee ballot to each active voter on the permanent absentee ballot list in accordance with the procedures and deadlines for regular absentee ballots under this chapter. Okay, questions from committee members. Everybody understand what the purpose is of that. And um, I guess my first question is, Carol Dawes, how does that how does that feel to you from a clerk's perspective of maintaining a an automatic um, absentee ballot list for the presidential and state primary? I actually voiced a, a, a concern um, back to Rep. Vahosky. My my concern is that we're we're creating multiple systems that it's that there is going to there, the potential for voter confusion. For local elections, they have to make annual requests. For the general election, they don't have to request at all. And now for the primaries, they can sign up for um, a lifetime uh, a request. And it, it just felt to me like we were creating some confusion. All right, Rep. Vahovsky. Yeah, and Carol, thank you. I did. I had hoped that this had come a little sooner so we could have connected ahead of time a little bit more. My hope in doing this is actually to decrease confusion as and move towards a more general, just general system where we all get ballots. And this was sort of an intermediary step for me from you get one in the general, but because I actually heard a lot of um, in in this last election, a lot of people who were waiting for their primary ballot and didn't know they had to sign up for a primary ballot, but were fully aware that the that the town ballot was going to be different. And so for me, this was sort of the intermediary and in making the primary and the general a little bit more similar in that you could once sign up and just always get that primary ballot, um, because I did actually have a fair amount of confusion in the in the these this last election where people thought they were going to get a primary ballot and then didn't and then had to go vote in person or it so so that I was actually hoping to decrease confusion with the town and local thing being one thing and then the the primaries and the states and the generals kind of being their own thing so that's my thought process representative higley Thank you, Madam Chair. I have to agree with Carol. I think this does make it confusing. I know that uh, a lot of my voters were confused with that first postcard that came out that asked to check a box for, uh, do you want to receive an absentee ballot? And, you know, they said, I thought I was going to be getting mailed one, or everybody was going to be getting mailed one. Um, so again, this is kind of along the same lines. It's like, you know, you request one for the primary, uh, you don't have to for the general. So um, yeah, confusing if you ask me. Thanks. Committee discussion? Yeah. 
don't see anybody diving in to fill the silence on this. Rep Pihovsky. Yeah, um, and just, sp uh, Rep Higley, I heard the same confusion and that was my hope in this is that it would eliminate that confusion in that once someone signed up and opted in, they would no longer get the postcard and they would just get one in the mail. Um, because I heard a lot that I heard a lot of that same confusion where that postcard came and they were like, I thought I was just going to get a ballot. And this is a means for someone to opt into just getting a ballot. I guess uh, my concern is why, why would you even have to do that then? Why, why wasn't it just everybody will receive a ballot in the primary as well? Well, that's what I would like too, but this felt like an intermediary step. Yeah, I yeah, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. I understand, but um, what, what's the additional cost as well for the primary ballots being mailed out to everybody? Uh, Significant. Yeah, Barry. Chris Winters and then, uh, and then Carol. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the discussion that we just had about the three ballots, the, the, the defective rates on the curative provisions, um, there are a lot of differences for uh, town meetings, annual meetings, and the August primary that get you into a lot of complicated areas of discussion. So, you know, there was an amendment on the Senate side, an attempted amendment to include the primary and, uh, and all local elections to be universal vote by mail. Um, but that's a much deeper discussion and there are a lot of different issues that you need to take into consideration, including cost, the cost of doing all of that. So we think it's a great discussion to have for the future, uh, but for now, vote by mail for the general election is what makes the most sense to treat things in the way that we did in, the, in, in 2020. We think that works well as a first step forward. Carol Doss. The uh, my other concern is um, it, the the proposed language includes the presidential primary, which is held in conjunction with the local town meetings. So so we would potentially have people signed up for permanent <laughs> absentee receipt of the presidential primary ballot, but they would have to remember to sign up for the town meeting ballot, and that would certainly create confusion with voters. Kapiewski. <laughs> I did not even think about the fact that we have those two different primaries. I wonder if it would feel less um, confusing to pull the presidential piece out and have, because if people are going to town meetings, they'll get that anyways, and to keep it at the state primary. Because I just wanna be clear that this language doesn't automatically mail everyone a primary ballot. It allows them to opt in to only, and only have to sign up once. So those people, theoretically are people who have said, yes, I want to vote in my primaries. Please mail them to me. Well, do you have thoughts? I don't, I don't feel strongly either way. And I indicated to um, Rep Vihovsky when she was talking about this idea that I, that I wouldn't oppose it and that, that I remain that way. I, I would just posit that, and I think it's a, you're trying to strike a balance that the way I see it and the voter confusion thing is very important and we're trying to address it as, as much as we can through our communications, of course, from my office. To me, the easiest message out of all of these various scenarios we're considering is that the only election you will have a ballot proactively mailed to you for is the general election in November. For all other elections, make sure you request a ballot. I think that's the least confusing message um, that we can have as a starting point until we get to the place where we're mailing out ballots for the primary, which is where I would like to get. Okay, I'm seeing a couple. And of also, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, yes. just in the language and this did, this came to us um, uh, right before the meeting and forgive me, Amarin, if I miss this, but I don't see any scenario where our office, the Secretary of State's office, would be mailing these ballots. <clears throat> so I would, I would suggest that our office be taken out of the language. Yeah. Um, Representative Gannon. Um, I'm just concerned. I mean, I think we're taking tremendous step forwards with, with mail-in balloting for the general election. And 
I'm just concerned about making too many significant changes, um, especially here where there's been some note of con that there could be potential confusion. Um, so I, I, well, I understand this and I, like Director Sunning, I would hope we could, you know, mail everybody a primary ballot at some point. I, I just worry about causing too much confusion with all these proposed changes. Rep Colston. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I agree with this train of thought. I, I think, you know, think big, but act small. How do we perfect this um, vote by mail with the general election, give it some more time, get, get some other bugs worked out, and then we expand down the road. But let's, let's take it on um, in a way to make sure we're not overloading ourselves and confusing people. Right, I'm starting to hear uh, consensus that, uh, that this is not quite ready for prime time. Okay. Um, so we have two more changes that I don't think we necessarily need Amarin to run through with us because they're pretty straightforward. Um, one is simply deleting the elections position that was in the bill because it is now contained in the in the Senate version of the budget, I believe, or both versions of the budget. It is in the Senate version. Excellent. Um, and a proposal to amend the title of the bill because the focus of the bill has changed since its introduction back in January. How, how do people feel about proposed change number six to amend the title of the bill? I'm, I don't see a majority yet. Anybody wanna recommend a different wording? Uh, Representative Higley. Uh, what's the title now? <laughs> uh, an act relating to correcting defective ballots, I think. And, and act related to mailing out ballots, correcting defective ballots and miscellaneous changes, that whole thing would be the new, new yes. title? Okay. Yes, because they get paid by the word. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> because it's more accurate to what we're doing in this bill, which has um, it's broadened it in scope since it was introduced. Madam Chair, I think that's what they call a callback in comedy, <laughs> what you just did there. <laughs> All right, uh, Representative LeClaire. I, I agree that it makes it much clearer about what the intent of this bill is. Okay, so we're, we're good to go on the title change. Um, and uh, so then we would be asking Amarin to, um, to incorporate changes one through three and five and six with some slight tweaks. Okay, so um, I'm gonna let Amarin go ahead and, and you know, stay off camera, um, you know, hopefully working um, on incorporating some of these changes if that's, uh, if that's something that she's able to do while we take a little bit more testimony. Um, I have been um, diligently working to see if I could find someone from a universal vote by mail state who would come and talk with us um, about some other uh, details about vote by mail. Um, and we have not yet been able to find uh, someone from Oregon, but we do have Audrey Klein. And, uh, and so I do want to uh, take a moment to uh, to have some more conversation. And uh, this is the time for committee members to, you know, to ask uh, questions of Audrey about uh, what other states do. Uh, but in particular, I had asked um, Audrey if she could help enlighten us on what, uh, what it looks like to implement a signature verification uh, program, because that has been one of the issues that I have been uh, approached by several of you committee members um, with an interest in exploring a little bit more. And um, so uh, Audrey, thank you for being with us. And, and I was hoping that you could uh, help up enlighten us a little bit. 
Hello, ma'am. Thank you for, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you for having me again. Um, for the record, Audrey Klein with the National Vote at Home Institute and Coalition. Um, thrilled to, to take some questions here if I, uh, if I can. Um, uh, signature verification is a, is a pretty common means um, of verifying that the ballot that is received by an election official is, is the one that is actually sent um, by a voter. Um, but it can also be quite complicated. So um, I understand that there's some, there might be some questions from the committee um, and I, I'd be pleased to sort of make myself available to answer what I can. Um, and if I need to, um, I would be more than pleased um, to help the, um, the, the chairwoman to find some other expertise um, around some of the other areas that might be a little more, more technical if we need. Okay, questions? Uh, Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess I'll start it off uh, looking into the uh, Oregon uh, signature verification process uh, and some of that information that was sent. There was an actual video of how they do it. Uh, I just want to run this, uh, run this by folks and, and see if I'm correct or see if there's another uh, process as well. But, um, you know, through the Secretary of State's office, they have a signature page um, from the uh, registration process that the voter goes through um, that is sent out to uh, all the, the clerks um, that they actually do uh, compare that signature um, on a screen, on a computer screen with what's there. Now, um, my understanding is uh, they look at a lot of different things. There has to be training, that's, that's true. Uh, they look at a lot of different things, and I believe that if there, if there is a concern, um, there is actually a second person that's, that's involved. And now that may not be, be able to be the case uh, in Vermont just because of the limited number of, of, of folks that, uh, um, that work the polls, but um, there is also a curing process as well. And uh, I'm not convinced that I appreciate the uh, Oregon's process of actually going uh, 14 days after the election uh, for a curing process as well. Um, but anyway, um, that's, that's, that's my understanding. Um, and it's, it's similar to the curing process for uh, other defects that uh, we're talking about looking at the, at the ballots uh, currently. So mm -hmm. um, I guess, and I don't know if, if Carol is still on or not, um, I think I, she had to, to step away. Okay, but I would I would be interested to ask Carol if the town clerks were asked at all about some sort of a signature verification or other verification process, um, and what their what their comments might be if there was any any polling or any any questions asked about that. But um, yep, we'll, we'll flag that but, and and. We'll definitely ask Carol's perspective on that. Um, any other questions that you wanted to ask of Audrey while we have her? Um, let me see. I think, uh, hang on just a second. We'll go to anybody else. There's a couple other hands. I'll, I'll come back with some other questions. Okay. Representative Gannon. Um, thanks. Um, Audrey, um, oops. Unmuted. Yep. Um, I understand there was a lot of litigation around signature verification um, in the 2020 election cycle. Um, can, can you discuss what the, the number of lawsuits that were brought and what, why they were brought? Wow, that's a that is kind of a that's a big and loaded question because uh, there was so much litigation last year. Um, and as far as I can remember. Um, a signature verification was actually sort of on the lower end of, of that scale for, for what I had been paying attention to. Um, and it was mainly because um, most of the litigation was actually around um, signatures for, uh, for witnesses and notaries. Um, and I, I can go ahead and check my math on that one. Um, but as far as I remember, there wasn't any, um, I cert certainly don't think anyone was ruled uh, that any of their processes were ruled as unconstitutional or uh, or anything like that. 
um, but I could certainly check on that. Um, but I, I do feel pretty strongly that most of the litigation was actually around whether or not you were requiring people to have uh, witnesses, multiple witnesses or notaries, um, especially in a, in a pandemic um, sort of situation, asking someone who might live alone to go and uh, uh, speak to someone or um, worse yet have to sit down with a notary and um, you know have some safety issues. That was where a lot of them were about. But um, that's not to say that there, it wasn't litigated. I just don't remember off the top of my head any states that um, had their signature verification systems struck down. Now, I am not a legal expert um, and, and that is sort of just off the top of my, my head. So I, I hope that is, uh, that is enough. Okay, and I have a follow-up question. It, it's my understanding from reading is that that um, signature verification rejections of ballots disproportionately hit certain dem demographic groups, um, and those include elderly voters, young voters, and voters of color. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, I, I think I've, um, and thank you for the question. I think I've seen um, some similar data. I, I certainly don't discount it. Um, what I think is important is that uh, across states, you see varying levels of rejection rates. And a lot of that is because of the processes that are um, put behind uh, some, some system like that. Um, uh, the process that uh, Representative Higley described um, is, is uh, similar to the one that I'm most familiar with um, in my home here at the great state of Colorado. Um, but it is intensive to keep those, those rejection rates low. So what that requires then is um, technology investments. So that could be software and hardware. Um, and then there's also sort of a multi-step process for a ballot to be rejected. So um, you're actually, uh, the, the representative mentioned it's, there's like one election judge. Here there's technically three. So um, the machine might reject uh, something um, saying that it's not as similar as it should be. And then it goes to a team of bipartisan judges uh, that are trained by the Secretary of State here in Colorado. There's a pretty extensive program for that. Um, and then those bipartisan uh, judges have to agree that the um, signature is not substantially uh, the same with anything that is on file. So even inside of this process, you are reaching back in time to all of the other signatures that uh, the Secretary of State, the local clerk, um, and other government entities are sort of aggregating. So there's a, there's a lot of technical processes in here. Um, and because Colorado is making uh, lots of investments in this kind of technology, we do keep our rejection rates quite low. Um, but uh, I actually, I can't wait to get the data on 2020 to look and see if these disparities still remain. Um, some states uh, that don't have all of these layers and layers of protection uh, for vulnerable populations, you see much higher rejection rates. So it is my um, emphatic hope that any state that is looking to implement something like this would also be making these quite large um, technical and training um, and institutional foundational investments that are necessary to protect folks um, that might be disadvantaged. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Representative Higley, I see that Carol Dawes is back, so uh, and I know that she has to wait on on folks coming in the office. So why don't you ask her while we have her for the moment? Yeah, thank you, uh, Carol. Uh, my question was: um, were the were the town clerks asked or polled at all about uh, what their thoughts are, are on any uh, uh, voter verification process, whether it be a, a signature verification or other? Um, I, we haven't done any kind of formal polling. I certainly have been involved in a number of conversations with, with clerks. Um, and I, I'm pretty comfortable saying that universally clerks are, are, not, um, are not in favor of, of any such um, verification requirements, mainly because of the amount of time uh, and training that would be necessary and the concern that 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 something would we would be called upon to make a judgment that we wouldn't feel um, equipped to make. 
and that that could uh, could nullify somebody's right to vote. And that's one of our biggest concerns. Hmm. Well, it's, it's amazing to me that uh, the state of Oregon has done it for 20 years with uh, 2.15 million votes just this past election. Thank you. Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Klein, for being here. Um, so my question is, um, so we know that there are other states that do the, sorry, I have it written down, so I spent a while to ask this question, um, that we know that other states have done the all mail-in elections with no problems for fraud, like the, the rates are very low, um, but all those states do employ some sort of verifiable ID process. If it's not signatures, or there is something that they do uh, signature matching, um, driver's license number, last four digit social security number, um, and they ban large scale ballot, uh, ballot harvesting. Is that correct from my recollection of what other states have in place that do all mail in voting? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and if it's all right with you, I'm going to use my cheat sheet that I have up on a screen right above this uh, and look up a, a little bit of that information. Um, as for a sort of ballot collection or a ballot harvesting, I don't have that um, on hand, but I do know that here in Colorado, uh, the, the sort of standard on that is that um, no one person can, uh, can sort of receive or turn in uh, more than 10 ballots um, per election. Um, and uh, let me tell you, as a, as a former sort of campaign pack, you know, back in the day, um, it's actually, it's, it is not easy to get people to, to cough up a ballot, even if you are, uh, you know, uh, just sort of a, a normal uh, person on the street just trying to help people vote. Um, so uh, I know myself, I, after knocking thousands and thousands of doors, I only ever um, turned in three ballots total um, that were not my own. And two of them were somebody who drove up uh, to me on the street and said, I don't know where the drop, the drop off box is. Are you, are you going by one sometime today? I, I can see that you're like, a, I was wearing like a campaign t-shirt and they gave them to me. Um, so it's, it's so, sort of an interesting issue to talk about because it is quite hard uh, to do in the first place. And we don't um, see any rates of fraud um, increasing or decreasing based off of how those uh, those policies are implemented across the country. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that's actually helpful. And then um, as for signature verification, it is, like I said, it is a very common um, piece of policy. Uh, how well it is done is sort of the real question. Um, there are states that when you are having your signature evaluated, um, it's not just the signature that is up on the screen. It might actually include something like your precinct or your, um, your party affiliation or any demographic data that might be uh, attached to your voter file, which we do not recommend. That is actually a bad process. Um, and so we just wanna be really, really clear that um, it's generally a process that works pretty well when it is done well, but it does take a lot of work um, and it does take a lot of investment to get that done. Thank you. So what about other options like last for a social or even driver's license number? I mean, I don't know how many people around here have a, like a price chopper card, but you give them your driver's license number to obtain that card. So it's not like, you know, people give this information out for things much less than your right to vote. Um, so ha have you seen other states implement that type of safeguard with implementing all mail in voting? We're just starting to see that as a policy that is, um, is being implemented in other states. Uh, Georgia is one that is that is sort of uh, working on something like that. Uh, Florida just had something similar for requests. Um, I don't think I have a fully rounded uh, view on it. I haven't seen data as to how it might affect someone, but I can tell you a story from literally yesterday. I was uh, at the Department of Motor Vehicles here in Colorado getting a new driver's license. Um, mine expired, which is uh, you know just the thing that happens to everybody. But the woman in front of me in line um, had just moved to Colorado from, I believe it was Louisiana, trying to get a driver's license. And um, be, she had her social security card, but what she didn't have um, was a passport uh, or her, and she's new to Colorado. So 
she actually got to the place where she also couldn't find her birth certificate because she was an elder, elderly woman and um, she was not eligible to get a driver's license. And it was, it was just kind of an incredible experience because we hear about it and um, for myself, I, I wasn't having any trouble with the process, but I watched somebody right in line in front of me uh, that, that couldn't even get something like that. So it is a very real issue of um, can everyone get a driver's license? Uh, I'm not gonna say that there aren't massive barriers to certain populations to that kind of thing. So um, it, is, it is my personal belief that a lot of these systems uh, are going to disenfranchise uh, voters, uh, no matter how well it is written into law and no matter how well intentioned. All set, Rep. LaFave. I'll be coming back, thank you. Rep. Behovsky. Thank you. Um, it's my recollection that the ACLU um, did testify was it just yesterday? It's so hard to keep track of the days, but yesterday that in fact, there are lawsuits pending. One is as close as New Hampshire on, uh, on signature verification. I believe there was also a, a case in Pennsylvania and it ultimately came down to due process for curing and the length of the curing process and, the, and it would impact clerks having to positively engage with a voter. So it would very much change what the curing process would look like for that due process to be enacted in order to be considered constitutional. So that's my understanding of the, the pending lawsuits. The two I know about are New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, but they did testify there are more. So I know that the ACLU is in opposition to this. I also know that the Vermont NAACP is in opposition to this and that there are multiple studies across the country that show that signature verification absolutely Absolutely, inordinately impacts communities of color, young voters, first time voters, women, trans voters. So I, I think that we need to be really, really careful in looking at potentially impacting communities who have previously already been impacted by, by our country's flawed, uh, just flawed attempts at so I guess what I'm getting at is voter suppression is a much bigger problem than voter fraud. And I think that we need to really be thinking about if we are going to go down this road, the incredible financial and time investment in making sure that it is done constitutionally without silencing one vote from a disenfranchised community or anyone else. So I guess that's not really a question so much as a statement, but I don't know if you have anything to add or I just think it's really important that we be really careful. Uh, it, thank you, ma'am. I... I, and what you said about cures is actually is really important. Um, at, right now, even uh, just with the sort of ways that you can reject a ballot in Vermont, you have some, you can have these very small windows to to cure something like that. So if you start adding length and um, and, and time and more processes to what a clerk is working on, um, right now we're at a place, uh, in my understanding of, of Vermont law that you can't extend the cure period after the election, um, especially because you're gonna run up against um, certification deadlines, then you also aren't gonna be able to report full results. Um, there's kind of a domino effect there that could actually hurt more voters um, than in a place that, that has that extra time after the election um, to allow for anyone who has um, a signature mismatch or a deficiency to cure that ballot. So these shortened timelines can actually um, they can backfire in some ways. So it, it, that is just another thing to sort of be aware of. Rep. Colston. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, expand on what uh, Rep. Yoski just shared. Um, and because this is such uh, an issue that impacts um, so many different voting groups, I think this conversation really requires a much more expansive um, uh, input, um, especially from those groups who are impacted. And I guess my question for you, um, Ms. Klein, is uh, what other strategies have been considered or, or been taken on to mitigate the disparities that are created by this, this system? That's a great question. Um, and I think that those conversations uh, are, are ongoing. Um, I know that my group, uh, the Vote at Home Institute, um, we've been proactively working with folks like the, um, the disability community, 
to understand um, how these these policies can interact with a community like that. Um, also, anyone with language access, mm -hmm. there's lots of different ways that this can um, be an extra challenge for folks. Um, and I'm not sure if we've come up with a, a perfect way to do it quite yet. Um, I think those conversations um, are gonna be deeply important, especially in this interim between um, the biggest vote by mail election in history um, and you know what comes next. Uh, there's lots of states and certainly Vermont is not the only one that has been contemplating large changes. Um, and we're here to support that. Um, but there, there might be some magic solutions out there that I have not quite found yet. Um, but certainly coming at these issues with an equity lens first um, is, is, is what I hope and what I think that Vermont is doing right now. So I want to continue to applaud this, this committee and, and this legislature for um, being really thoughtful on the issues. And we're gonna be here to partner on that. And I, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have perfect solutions for you quite yet. Thank you. Absolutely. Rep Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess listening to the conversation, I'm really sorry that somebody from the uh, state of Oregon, the Secretary of State's office out there, couldn't be here to, to answer questions because these have all been good questions. I tried to ask as many as I could. And, and again, I just have to say 20 years of doing this process you can't tell me that the state of Oregon uh, is experiencing all kinds of disenfranchisement with this voter um, um, signature uh, verification process. Uh, you know, I asked the question, um, and I'm, I'm not saying that there's not some problems, but there's always gonna be some problems. But these are the sort of questions that they could answer specifically as, as to what they're doing. As far as folks with disabilities and all that, there was examples of, uh, um, oh, uh, signature stamps. There was examples of uh, people that have uh, disabilities that, that uh, might have cerebral palsy, other things like that. They even have a process now that you can vote through an iPad. I mean, these are questions that, that they can answer for you. I, I don't feel that I should answer these questions. And I, you know, 20 years ago, they felt that it was important to reach all the registered voters in the state, but they also realized that it was important to have a, a sense of security around that. And for, for us not to be able to a, talk to a state that has done it for 20 years, I think is a disservice to what we're attempting to do. And, and just for Deputy Secretary uh, Winters and, and um, Will Sennings uh, information, I, again, uh, we, you, you had mentioned it as well as far as what's happening across the country. We're in a, we're in a different era. And I mentioned it in, in the, other, um, the other day in committee. Um, uh, and I think it's important for you to hear as well. I'm sure if you didn't hear about it, you need to hear about an issue where uh, a group of individuals stifled a member of the, the councils um, uh, in Burlington ability to speak at a council meeting. And these are the sort of things that concern me going forward in the future, that if, if groups like that would be willing to do that at a meeting, they, they were caught, they, they have to go through diversion, whatever it is. I, I can guarantee you that if things get more politically um, aggressive and, and contentious, that things are gonna happen with a ballot harvest or an issue around, you can say all you want that it doesn't happen. And, and I certainly appreciate and, and, and believe that this word to one year into it. And um, I just think that it's, it's more important than ever to, to look at it the way that Oregon did. I mean, I can't believe I'm supporting something, you know, that or Oregon passed 20 years ago and, and I'm coming around to this. You know, this is something that I talked about months ago here saying that, I don't think it's the right thing to do. I think there's voter responsibility. Uh, there's a process already for it. I'm coming around to this, but the way I'm coming around to it is some sort, some sort of, of uh, verification uh, that, you know, sure it's gonna be a lot of work and it may cost more money, but um, going forward, how important is this process? Again, I'll mention the Sarah Bucks and David Ainsworth races twice within one vote. So one vote does count. And I don't believe that 
the state of Oregon would disenfranchise a whole group of, of folks, regardless of who they are, without a total outcry. And if we can't talk to them, I guess you're not going to hear that. So I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to hear that. Sir, thank you. Thank you for your comments. I do have a little bit of information trickling in. I have my researcher pulling up some of our notes on our end. And it looks like in the 2020 general election, there was 16,680 rejected ballots in Oregon for signature reasons alone. That's a total percentage of 0.69. Um, uh, and we're looking into the other uh, sort of percentages for any other ballot defect reasons, but um, that's 16,680 people uh, that had to go through some sort of a cure process, um, which is substantial. Um, and it's also, you know, that's a lot of work on clerks. Um, not to say that it, it isn't um, you know, valid, I, but that's just what the process is. And, um, you know, as some of the other representatives have um, brought up, um, they, it does trend to be younger voters um, and people of color that have their signatures rejected and they have to go through a, a cure process. So, um, and once they make it through the cure process, what that actually means is that they had to take an extra step um, to have their, their vote counted and their voice heard for their government. Um, and so uh, if, I, I, don't, I don't really wanna sort of get into the, the larger issues on it, but um, I think that's important to know that, that that's a significant amount of people that have to take one more step um, to have their voice heard while other people did not. So um, I think there is there is some validity to the argument and you need to continue to refine processes. Um, and it, it just takes investment. It takes a lot of time and a lot of work. Um, so I, I will continue to sort of like beat on that drum. It, it does work for states um, that have been working on it, as you said, for, for quite some time. Uh, so, I'm wondering if your researcher has the ability to um, to to shed a little light on the geographic distribution of those 16,000 um, votes that mm -hmm. were rejected for signature match. Were they coastal Oregon? Were they interior Oregon? A little of both, uh, you know, a sprinkling of one or two here and there, or you know, one election official who was really diligent? <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that question. I, I will take a look, uh, certainly. Um, we're kind of gleaning from uh, what's called the Eves Report. Um, uh, obviously, the 2021 hasn't come out. We got that uh, somewhere else, and I'd be happy to send you a citation on that. Um, but the Eves Report, uh, if you're interested in these sorts of things, uh, is something that's put together by the, uh, the EAC, and it comes out um, about 18 months after every major election. So uh, it's gonna be a little while till we see 2020 data. But if you wanna look state by state as to um, how many absentees uh, versus how many rejections or um, registration data, there's all kinds of really fascinating tidbits in there. And I'd encourage um, this committee and anybody who works in elections to sort of dive in there uh, and see what you can see. Because it is, um, it's really interesting to see how these numbers change from state to state. Thanks. Rep. Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Klein. So I just had a clarifying question that I asked people when they first came in to testify at the beginning of this about how if all these implications took place, that my fear would be we would be the least secured voting system in the United States. And so I was that I got asked, you know, why do I think it? How could I think that? Um, so I'm going to ask you the, what we specifically have for accessibility to our voting and if through your um, to help with the team you have working, if you can find any other state that has all of these accessibilities without the safeguards that they have put into place. Um, I'm not uh, sure if you would like to write them down or. Yeah, yeah, I would love that. Um, what in particular are you looking for? So what other state has mailing ballots to all active voters, the honor system of the absentee ballots, and by that I mean no requirement for any verifiable information to confirm the identity of the voter. Um, so in the state of Vermont, we can just call our town clerk, say, hey, this is Sam Lefebvre. Um, could you please send my ballot? Um, I'm gonna be out of town. So it's just the honor system of uh, not sending it back. Um, you know, um, And then the 45 days of early voting, 
the same day voter registration, automatic voter registration, and legal large scale ballot harvesting. So if you could, if there's any other states out there that have this. Um, so I know there's five other states that have the all mail in voting. So I guess would be one of those five that also implement this with no safeguard. I think that's an interesting question. I can absolutely take a look into it. I think the five that you're contemplating all have um, some kind of signature verification system. Um, one that I thought was interesting is that in uh, Maryland in 2020 for their primary, um, they also mailed uh, ballots to all voters um, with a sort of a, with a signature is present uh, requirement. So that's one that would be very close to what you're looking for here. Um, but I'd be happy to sort of continue to take a look. Um, actually, here's, a, here's an interesting parallel. Um, Nebraska actually has, um, I wanna say it's 30 counties. Most of Nebraska actually um, proactively mails uh, ballots to a, most, if not all voters. Uh, the only ones that don't are actually the largest counties. They're, um, there's a cap on how many voters your county can have in order to send uh, uh, ballots proactively. So most of Nebraska is working under sort of a similar um, uh, sort of setup, um, but they actually don't have some of the other things that add you know, lots and lots of security to, to the system, like same day voter registration, automatic voter registration, things like that. So there's a lot of sort Correct. of things or the, on the Yeah, or the mail, early mail-in voting. I mean, the early, I'm sorry, the max of the early voting. Um, and so I appreciate you looking into that. And um, I, I thank you for your input. And then I just have one question for our committee. Um, sorry, I know you've been in the hot seat for a while, um, but I was just hoping if our committee could take um, serious, um, uh, of serious care of my concerns and at least see if we can have a consideration of banning uh, ballot harvesting, uh, making it, in, you know, just something. I understand that we have the concerns and I do not at any point want to disenfranchise someone from their right to vote. And that is something that I think I've made very clear from the very beginning of this. Um, I do not want also the integrity of our voting to go to go away. Um, I do know that more people, um, you know, I have read many studies also where if people feel their vote doesn't count, then they do not cast a vote. And that's their right to vote. So it might not happen next election. It might not happen two elections from now, but it's gonna be very sad when three elections from now, we're having surveys of people not voting because they don't think their vote counts. And that's something that I met out on the trail is people said, oh, you know, I'd love to support you or I'd love to support that candidate or this candidate, but I don't vote because my, you know, my vote doesn't count. And that's, that's sad to hear. So I would like at least like to hear from, you know, our committee, what their thoughts would be of getting the language put in of banning ballot harvesting. Or collecting, please. I can answer because I believe I have a fully formed thought on that. Um, if someone is concerned that they shouldn't vote because their vote isn't counted, why would we give another reason for that vote to be rejected by saying, the clerk can reject a, a, a ballot because somebody else dropped it off. I mean, to me, that that is uh, an arbitrary reason. And in a state like Vermont, where you know my 90-year-old neighbor might have trouble even walking to the end of her driveway to put her ballot in the outgoing mailbox, um, you know, I don't see why she couldn't send it to the drop box with uh, you know with her neighbor who's going there with his ballot anyway. So um, I, I'm happy there, to- There are numbers that, there's numbers, you know, like limit of 10, you know, that's not gonna shut down anyone from walking down their main driveway to pick up your neighbor's ballot. It just is gonna, it's gonna help make sure that down the road when more things might come about as other members have mentioned, that we're not seeing things that we, we wish we had put language in for. You know, I think capping at 10, you could go collect, you know, even if you had four people in your house, you brought their ballots, there's still, you know, six other ballots you could go help out. 
Uh, we just heard testimony that there was heart, you know, someone was volunteering, go to door to door for thousands of people and they only collected three, two which were given to her for help. So, you know, I'm not trying to disenfranchise anybody, but also I'm asking for some sort of safeguard to be please put in to this language. Um, Rep. Vihovsky. My comment was not on this subject, so I'm certainly happy to wait if there are comments on this particular subject and come back to mine. Is there anyone who wants to jump the line on this particular topic of returning more than 10 ballots? Rep. Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Klein, I think you had mentioned that Colorado has a limit. What, what, what was that? It is, uh, I believe it is 10 per election. I can, I can look that up as well, um, if you'd like. Okay, and as long as I've, I've got you for a second, uh, on the um, signature rejections in, in Oregon, uh, was that the initial rejections or was that after the curing process? That is a good question. Um, let me see if... I do not have that answer for you. Um, I'm happy to, I know we have the chat here on the Zoom that we're all on, um, to just send a, a quick uh, link to the news story where we're able to pull that one. Um, there's some other more extensive data that I think will be released um, in the future. Okay, thank you. I think that would be critical because uh, if it's, if it's uh, a after the curing process, that's a little more, concerning than prior to the curing process. Yeah, I think it's important to note that um, even sort of within these, it, the ballot cures are often affected by how sort of competitive um, a, a state can, can be. Um, and I think that that's important to know that then you would sort of see a disproportionate effect as you get further down the ballot as well. So um, I, I have, Anecdotally, um, seen folks say, um, as I was uh, working here on campaigns in Colorado, say, "Obama won. Um, I don't. I don't need to like. I don't really care if my vote counted at this point." Um, and so that was actually disproportionately affecting things that got all the way down to the bottom of the ballot, like a county commissioner race. Is that is actually the one that I was uh, working on at the time? And so the the margin out of three hundred fifty thousand votes in that county got down to, I think it was about 600. So every vote was really counting in that um, specific uh, race. But then you'd be talking to folks and they'd be like, eh, I don't really wanna do that work anymore. Um, so I don't need to sign this like this affidavit. And I, it, it can just, there are just lots of disparate effects. Um, and I, I just want this committee to, to be um, aware of what can sort of happen downstream. And, and Ms. Klein, if I could, I guess going back to the other question around the 10, the, uh, 10 max uh, uh, votes that can be turned in by any one individual, I guess, what was Colorado's reasoning for passing something like that? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure um, if I was around uh, when that, that particular piece of the law was written. Uh, so I, I don't have the firsthand knowledge on that. But it's also important to know that like there's there's actually not an enforcement mechanism to that either. Um, there's not anybody standing around. There's no you know it's not like you have a punch card uh, that you <laughs> that you like take to your clerk and you know they say okay well that's four for you this year. It's really um, it, it's some we, some we, call it unenforceable. We do that a lot around here as well. Mm -hmm. Anyone Thank else you. want to weigh in on Thank this you. question? All right, back to you, Rep. Pihovsky. Wonderful. Thank you. So it's my understanding that in Oregon, all election officials are trained in forensic handwriting analysis. Ms. Klein, do you know how long that training takes? Or does anybody here know how long that training takes? I don't uh, firsthand, and again, this is another one of those things that changes from state to state. So usually you're looking at a secretary of state to codify, or not codify, promulgate some rules um, that would sort of make those declarations. I'd be happy to look into what the differences look like. 
And again, that goes back to some of the, the points that I've been trying to make is that states vary widely on what kind of training they require. Um, how, are you gonna bring in someone from the FBI to do forensic handwriting training with all of your clerks? That is absolutely an option. Um, it, it, it may not be feasible and it may not be advisable, but it's certainly there. Then there's other states that just don't have any rules around this whatsoever. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, every county in the whole state of Florida sort of does these things a little differently. Um, and that's another way that you sort of see disparate rates of, you know, there's a 12% rejection rate in this county and there's one that's under 1% in this county. What's the difference? It's all in the, the, the training and the rules and uh, the, the processes that need to be really well refined to make sure that you're not, um, you're not disenfranchising voters. It's also my understanding that in Florida, younger first time voters, um, people from racial and ethnic minorities and women are almost twice as likely to have their vote rejected because of a signature mismatch than other than other individuals. So I, I think that you're pointing to something really important about the importance of, of really in depth training. Um, and so I, I think that that raises a pretty big concern for me. I also know that in many that it, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, I'm sort of synthesizing information in my non lawyer brain, but it is my understanding that a court case cannot be decided on a forensic handwriting analysis. And so if we are going to say that we're going to deny someone their constitutional right to vote on something that wouldn't hold up in court to convict them of a crime that feels to me pretty problematic. And I don't, I don't know if anyone want, like, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that or, or I don't know. I am also not a lawyer. Uh, I just sometimes pretend to play one on Zoom. Um, but I, I think that is, a, an, is an interesting point. And, and the data does show that, um, that there are disparities, in, especially in places like Florida, as you pointed out. Um, and we've, at the National Vote at Home Institute, we try and design policies that sort of reduce that kind of uh, disparity or any harm that would come to a voter. Um, but as I've all, all also said, there is not really a perfect process for this. And so um, uh, you can be affected by something like, I, I had a broken hand two years in a row um, and I was really concerned that my ballot would be rejected. Uh, thankfully, I have a very distinctive A uh, so I think that that got me through the process here in Colorado, but um, I also had been concerned about my mother. Um, my, my late mother had Parkinson's, and so we never really knew when she was going to have a good day or a bad day. And I think those are valid concerns. I, I don't want to, um, to say that something like that um, might not get someone uh, re have their ballot rejected. Um, but I also do know that there are, there are times, very, very few, I will emphasize very few, um, where people have, have tried to submit a ballot uh, on behalf of someone else and they got caught by this process. Um, they, they are just exceedingly, incredibly, deeply rare. The one that I'm thinking of here in Colorado was that actually a husband uh, signed a ballot for his wife. Um, I'm not gonna say that that does not happen, but um, it could also be mitigated by a similar process as to the one that you had recommended um, representative, uh, where if you are getting proactive ballot notifications and someone, you know, you get that text message, like I get on my phone that says, we received your ballot, Audrey, uh, congratulations, here's your digital I voted sticker. If you received that text message and you didn't turn in a ballot, that is probably the best way for someone to proactively contact the clerk and say something's going on here. So uh, there, there's a lot of different ways to, to ensure that you have a secure process. I recognize that you probably don't have the exact numbers in front of you, but what I hear you saying is that the instances of legitimate voter fraud that these methods have caught are far fewer than the instances of disenfranchised votes and votes that have been prevented because of the impl implementing these things. I feel like I can say that pretty confidently. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure as you've heard, the Heritage Foundation actually keeps up um, an extensive database of um, voter fraud cases. Um, I kind of actually enjoy reading up on them every once in a while. And, and just an incredibly small few of these entire, I think it's like 1300 cases over you know, decades. Um, 
so very few of them had to do with absentee ballots in the first place, and then even fewer have to do with outright fraud in, in the way that we're speaking about it right now. Great, thank you. My pleasure. All uh, right, um, Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, I guess I, I, I've heard several comments made about uh, certain groups of people being disenfranchised by these different things, but they all seem to be personal beliefs and assumptions. Is there any data out there that somebody could look at and actually ascertain that this is really what happens if you have signature verification by age group, by race, by age? Representative Gannon, you just popped your hand up. Does that mean you're the data guy and you have data? <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay. All right, Alexa. <laughs> uh, in an analysis of the 2020 Florida prim primary by the Stanford MIT Healthy Elections Project, they found that black and Hispanic voter ballots were rejected at roughly double the rate of white voters. The same was true in Wisconsin. Um, in, in 2018, um, in Gwinnett County in Atlanta, um, the county rejected more than 7% of mail-in ballots. Um, and then when they looked at the race of those people, um, only 3% of the ballots that were rejected were for white voters, 5.1% for Hispanic voters, and 10.3% for Black voters, and 13.9% for Asian Americans. Hmm. And was there any sort of analysis done on that? I mean, I'm assuming that whatever software they're using it doesn't it's not able to ascertain a person's nationality so well they may not have software that's part of the problem not all states use software um some just use a, a manual or i should say a visual um count by by two election officials typically of different parties um, okay not every state is using any sort of software but, but even given that as a scenario, the two people that are looking have no idea the nationality of the person or the sex or age of the person that's signing that, right? It's just a matter of comparing what they have for signature on record versus the one they're looking at. I believe you're correct, but it, it does um, raise concerns about the disenfranchisement of certain voter groups. Okay. And there Thank is you. evidence that are, are uh, rejected for sig signature ver verification much often, older voters, as well as people of color. Okay. Thank well, you, John. Sorry, I'm sure that Audrey was going <clears> to <throat> maybe jump in and remind the committee of what she mentioned earlier, which is which was news to me, but speaks to um, your question, Rep. LeClaire, mentioning that some of the software itself, I think, or systems, when the signature comparison is presented to the person, contains voter information. Um, and that that she would advise against that if we were to implement any such system. Yes, absolutely. Um, good point, Will. And, and it's also, there's, uh, the software itself is, is, is software, and it's uh, a lot of, uh, in how you use it. So you can, um, you can kind of set the dial to how sensitive you want it to be. Um, there, there are no sort of federal guidelines around these things. There's no, um, you know, uh, sort of hemming in of how different states do it. Um, so it would be um, up to either the Secretary of State or, you know, maybe even the town clerk as to like how, how much do they want to scrutinize? Um, what is the criteria for that? Um, and in those decisions are the ones that, that sort of lead you to either a good process or a bad process or uh, more rejections or less. Um, how sensitive do you want that to be is, is, is really important. Um, and it oftentimes goes wrong. Uh, Deputy Secretary Winters. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think Audrey may have mentioned it before, but another thing that we would need to think about in the state of Vermont is that we don't have central processing like some of these other 
like I think all of these other five states do where elections are administered either by county um, or they have these big vote centers where all the ballots go. So you can concentrate more of that expertise for signature matching. Um, it would be, it's worth repeating, it would be a significant undertaking for us to train 246 clerks to become some kind of handwriting experts. And I don't, I don't think we're saying that, that the Oregon system uh, doesn't work well. I, I, I think, I'm sure it does work well after many years of training and a lot of investment in equipment and people. Um, and then the other thing that just struck me was that I think Audrey pointed out there were something like 16,000 rejections, but she's also talking about how there's such a small instance of voter fraud. So, you know, just think about that many signatures getting rejected, that many follow ups, that many curative processes, and no actual fraud or, or very, very little actual fraud coming of it. Thank you. All right, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize, I had to put my hand down before my dogs thought they heard a monster. So it was not fun here. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to go back to my, I, I hear the concerns. And again, I do not want to disenfranchise any voter. I want every voter that, you know, that has their right to be able to vote. Um, could we please um, contemplate being able to have a ban on bringing in more than 10 ballots um, again, might not be enforceable, um, but I would like if someone was to have that found the same, the same situation if you were caught to be, uh, you know, not being true with voting. So the same, the same disclaimer, wrong hand, the same disclaimer we have on our, on your ballot would be the same if you were to be, uh, found bringing in more than 10 ballots. Um, I'm asking, I'm asking for that, please, just for us as a committee. Um, if it's something that we don't find is there's a lot of fraud, then I don't see the harm of us at least putting in attempting a safeguard. I hear the concerns for the others. I hear this is going to be a discussion that we're going to have to have a deeper look at. But could we please look at at least putting in the ballot collection and harvesting? All right, so we have a couple of people whose hands are up who may not be intending to speak on this. So would you raise your physical hand um, if you would like to weigh in on, uh, on this concept? Oh. Oh, yes, Rep Colston. <laughs> thank you. Spacing out here. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, you know, I'm struggling with this because um, I'm reminded of a phrase from my friend from Barrytown. You know, we're creating a solution for a problem. So I, I, I'm just, I don't, I don't understand why we need to make an issue of it when it's not an issue. May I ask a question, Madam Chair? You can ask. I'm not hearing a lot of um, chattiness on the part of your colleagues in committee, but you can feel free to ask. Well, that, I mean, that's just one person opposing. I mean, that doesn't, you know, there's not a lot of people opposing, just one. So we're tied right now, one to one. Uh, but my question is, how do we know it's not a problem? How do we know that's not happening? Show I'm asking for it not just to be prevented. Let's see the evidence. Yeah, how do you know it is a problem? That's that's what I want to hear. What's the evidence? Thank you. Well, I I think I think that what what fundamentally this comes down to is um, I don't know that we have even defined or or that we had agreement that it is a problem for someone to help someone else get their ballot to the polling place, and uh, it's kind of a neighborly thing to do, which is why I don't um, I don't think it is, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think the, the implication in saying that is that somehow that means that the person who's transporting those ballots has fraudulently executed some of those ballots. And I don't think that that is something that we are seeing evidence of. So 
So I would hope the intent is that I'm not asking you for a not to do a neighborly thing. And I don't know how many people in here bring 10 ballots, 10 of their neighbors ballots in. Um, but I'm asking for it to be provisions more of large, large parties and larger groups, um, you know, can, can't do it. Um, and if that, that's what I'm asking for. And again, it might not be something we see a problem now, but down the road, I'd like to have it to be something that is not a problem. Um, again, a neighborly thing to me, yes, go ahead, pick up your neighbors. Again, there's, there's 10 people, nine, not including yourself. Uh, you know, it'd be for more of the unions and special interest groups to systematically collect ballots on a large scale, not a neighborly thing. That's not what I'm doing. And that's not the intentions of what I would like this to be portrayed as. I'm not cutting down any neighborly acts. I'm asking for a safeguard to be put into this language. We're opening it up and I've yet to be shown the facts that where any other state has everything that we have without some type of safeguard put in. So when that's shown to me, um, I'll, I'll stop trying to fight for a safeguard. Until then, I'm not going to. All right, I'm gonna run through the hands that are raised. Uh, Rep Vihovsky. Um, I just wanted to point out that it is a felony to mess to do anything with the federal mail to take things out of the mail or add things into the mail that are not yours it's a federal felony i also want to point out that in ohio i believe it was in a 2020 case a, an expert found that 97 percent of the challenge signatures were in fact the right signature and so this to me when i look i simply looking at the numbers we know that racism is real and people of color are disenfranchised from every aspect of our society we know that people with disabilities are disenfranchised from every aspect of our society. And I am certainly happy to connect with any one of the groups out there that can give me the data points. But what we do not know, and in fact, there's overwhelming evidence to show that voter fraud is not a widespread problem. 97% of the challenge signatures were found to be the person who, signed, who initially signed it. So we can't say that 97% of the safeguards we put in place do not impact already disenfranchised groups. I feel pretty strongly that we need to be doing everything we possibly can to ensure that everyone who is eligible to vote can vote. I also would be curious to hear from the Secretary of State's office what it would take First of all, even if there are best practices around implementing something like this and what it would take for Vermont to implement them. Will or Chris, thoughts on that question? Chris, you go to me taking that one. Um, so a, a number of things, and I, I'm sorry, I was in another chat as well, but I, what I heard from you, Rep Vihosky, is what it would take here in Vermont to implement that kind of system. Well, to implement the best practices of some sort of, of signature verification, I, I have yeah. fundamental qualms with a license because that impacts groups that we already know. Are, I mean, it's the same concern I have with that being our automatic voter registration system. I don't think I need to reiterate them. But my yeah. question is, do we know if there are best practices that ensure we are not disenfranchising already disenfranchised groups? And if so, what would it take to implement them in Vermont? I don't know if I can answer yes to the first part of that question. Um, but in terms of signature verification, it would, be a, it would be a massive undertaking to implement in Vermont. I wanna make one thing clear to the committee um, <clears throat> to begin with is that we do not have signature images on file for any of our registered voters right now. So the first step in the process would be figuring out how we collect signature images um, assigned to each of our voters. And I think having thought about that and some of the other pro some of the other things it would take to implement this, if 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 we were suggesting that signature matching was required before we move forward, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this system any sooner than 2024 and probably later. Um, Chris pointed out, and I think it's it's um, really important to note that in these states that have been doing it for a long time, um, most of them have centralized processing, especially of the early absentee by mail ballots. So they're coming into 
far fewer number of those locations than our 246 town clerks. Those locations are where the software and the hardware is set up and where the experts and signature verification are there to adjudicate um, ones that are identified as possibly not matching. I also just like to note that um, while, while we have been unable to hear from someone from Oregon today, uh, I wanna make sure the committee is aware that we haven't approached any of this process in a vacuum um, and that we are in constant contact with my colleagues in other states. I know the director of elections in, or in Colorado very well, um, in Washington very well. Unfortunately, um, in Oregon, they have an interim director right now who I haven't had a chance to meet and establish a relationship with. I know the former director from Oregon very well, who's the person who put in place their system over the 20 years that Rep Pigley is talking about. And I've had a lot of conversations with all these folks on an ongoing basis, including a standing Friday call with all of my colleagues across the country that's been going on for a year or more, trading ideas, figuring out what makes sense. A common theme that comes out of those discussions is that what works in one state doesn't necessarily work in another. Um, and that it's really important for states to craft their vote by mail systems in a way that makes sense for them. Backing up just a little bit, I wanna remind the committee kind of where we, how we find ourselves where we find ourselves, right? Before coronavirus, um, myself and Secretary Condos wouldn't have told you we'd be implementing a vote by mail system anytime soon in Vermont um, because a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, about the care that it takes um, and the investment that it takes, et cetera, we went ahead and were forced to, to do it on an emergency basis last year. Coming out of, of that project, which was an incredible challenge, um, and I'm very proud of how we ended up meeting it, of course, um, people really liked that process um, across the board, across parties, and Rep Higley, that's why I appreciate you, you acknowledging yourself sort of coming around to um, the idea of proactively mailing ballots out. Um, the governor himself seems, seems fully supportive of this idea and in fact has been arguing to expand it to the primary and asking why we weren't doing that. So with that wave of support for trying to keep this, this process in place, that again put a huge challenge in front of me and my office to, to do it for um, 2022, coming up in two years. Um, so all of that is to say that I've been clear since the beginning of the testimony in the Senate GovOps committee that we need to approach this vote by mail system that we're implementing in a way that makes sense in Vermont. Um, and because we decided to still have ballots returned directly to your individual 246 town clerks, um, that makes it very hard to implement a signature matching system that I could stand behind as fair to all voters. Um, I have serious concerns about the the different way that signature matching might be treated among towns and even among election officials within a town. Um, the training that would need to be invested to train the officials to sort of reduce that risk and reduce that concern on my part and all the voters part would be pretty immense. Um, I've talked, like I said, with the director in Colorado a number of times, and Audrey touched on it. I'm sure Audrey knows Judd to some extent. Um, he's a longtime director and sort of a leader in my community of election directors. As he described the process at these centralized locations in Colorado that are processing massive amounts of absentee ballots coming back all at once, that you can't rely 100% on the software. <laughs> that's not a catch-all solution. And the way that a lot of this software works is you set <laughs> parameters. You set a certain degree of confidence that the software wants in the signature match. And of course, you can't set it at 100% because you'd end up disenfranchising a whole lot of people. So you, you allow it to allow for some difference, right, between the two images. Depending on how much difference you allow is the number that end up going to the three-person committee. The point is they have both... Um, software and human eyes that have to be applied before the decision's made. You can't, there's no easy sort of solution with software that's gonna make this very easy for all of our Vermont clerks. And I think I'll leave it at that. You heard Carol's pretty strong sentiment that um, this is not an idea that's supported by any clerk she's spoken to. Um, and it would, it would add a massive amount of work to their plate in the processing of these absentee ballots that, that process that I was describing.
having to you before of a clerk sitting at their desk making the defective ballot adjudication and quickly sending a postcard is out the window if they're if they're having to engage in this whole signature matching process. Um, so, and then it just risks so many more defective ballots and needing to cure when that's been the point of all of the testimony and how we've set up this whole process is to try and bring those. Um, one last thing, right? And then you're, you're balancing all of that investment, all of that training, the money, the time, the potential for a lot more defective ballots, the need for people to cure, the fact that that will probably lead to allowing for cures after the election and you balance it all against the instances of fraud that we've seen, the evidence of the fraud we've seen, this particular kind of fraud, signing the certificate envelope for another voter, forging your signature and sending in their voted ballot. All of the both um, informal and formal studies I've seen and then informal discussions with my colleagues is that the instances they do see where the signatures don't match are what Audrey mentioned, their wife signing for husband, vice versa, or for college student, most likely under the impression, you know, having heard from the college student what they want to vote and then just signing the envelope because they're not there to send it back. Um, in that regard, I just think it's worthwhile because Rep Higley, you, you rightfully were hoping to hear from some people from other states. We haven't had a chance to yet. I just want to read, it was last week, I think sometime, um, in True North reports here in Vermont, um, they cited and quoted some testimony by the director of elections, Justin Lee, who I also know really well, really nice guy in Utah, who, that mail ballots out to all voters. And I found his response to the questions really enlightening and interesting. This is from a um, excerpt from the Deseret News, they say here in True North. <laughs> Lee told the committee, Utah hasn't seen widespread voter fraud, but there've been instances where voters have signed a ballot on behalf of someone else, such as a spouse, partner, or child in my school. County officials catch those cases because they verify every signature against the voter's signature in the state database, he said. If that happens, voters are to earn that they are committing a crime. And then his quote is, we don't see a lot of repeat offenders when we reach out and let them know that, Lee said. So you're not seeing sort of systematic efforts to commit a ton of voter fraud by forging signatures and send back a large volume of ballots to throw a race one way or another. What you're seeing is mistakes made by people who don't understand that it's not okay and who don't repeat the mistake um, once they're informed of that. And then the next paragraph is the most important one, follows directly from that, right? <laughs> we don't see a lot of repeat offenders when we reach out and let them know that, Lee said. Alternatively, over the years, it says, the larger concern among Utah voters has been to make sure election officials don't discount their ballot because the signature on the envelope doesn't match the one in the database due to age, injury, or neat or messy handwriting on any given day, he said. <laughs> so he clearly identified the bigger problem and the bigger concern among their voters is the potential disenfranchisement um, from comparing their signatures. So if you can't tell, I would oppose the idea of implementing a signature requirement at this time. It's certainly something we can look into if we have more evidence that this kind of fraud is occurring as we implement this system. So I hear you saying that you couldn't guarantee within a 97% certainty that we weren't disenfranchising voters, even though we're seeing that the voter fraud rates, even in states that are doing this work, are it, potentially 97% not happening. No, I couldn't. Thank you. Uh, Rep Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to go to uh, Rep Lefebvre's uh, request, uh, I could get behind a uh, uh, a 10 person uh, limit on on uh, bringing in uh, ballots. Uh, it doesn't just uh, go to mail fraud. I mean, there are drop boxes now, uh, so it doesn't have to go through the mail. Um, the the other concern, and I think, hang on just a second, I'll get that phone. The other concern that was talked about whether or not there could be pressure put on uh, different groups as far as uh, knowing that uh, everybody received a ballot. Um, so, oh, um, I'm sorry. 
Anyway, I lost my I lost my train of thought. So I'll come back to you. Right. How's that? <laughs> uh, Representative Gannon. Uh, I also wanted to address uh, Representative Lefebvre's concern. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went and looked at the language um, in the bill. Um, and on, um, what is it, page 15, I mean, you know, a candidate or a paid campaign staffer can only return ballots uh, of that candidate or that paid campaign staffer, their immediate family. I won't go into the definition of immediate family. Um, um, you know, or if they're a caretaker. So it really restricts a candidate or paid campaign staffer from returning ballots. And that's already in the bill. So I'm just wondering what, I mean, that seems to address your concern. Maybe I'm wrong. I would also like if we would keep that language to have it, um, put in there for uh, no unions or special interest groups. Uh, that's not a paid campaign staffer. Those, those, you know, those people, you know, I know m many of them that would work on behalf of a campaign, but not be paid. Um, and I, I, you know, and when you asked for the proof, um, I go back to the North Carolina um, congressional nine district of the 2008 congressional race where an election was actually overturned by this. So it's, it's recent, it's happened, didn't happen in Vermont, but a lot of the stuff we're giving data on isn't Vermont, it's other places we're comparing. Um, so it, it, it has happened and I'd like to prevent it here. So it, there's, um, there is already language in there preventing it. I'd like to add a little bit more and just go away with ballot collection of no more than uh, 10 ballots are turned in by one person um, to prevent the unions and special interest groups. Uh, Rep Higley, you're back. No, I'm good. I, I'm done. I'm, I'm exhausted. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I have to say, this has gone on long enough that I almost forgot what I was going to say. Um, a couple things. I hate it when somebody uses the, my words against me, but I think it's actually a solution in search of a problem. But that's fair. <laughs> um, I have to say, I... I uh, Samantha's suggestion, I have to say, I find that somewhat intriguing. I've had some concerns about this legislation for a while, but that would alleviate some of my concerns. Um, I think that we all agree that there's special interest groups out there. It doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, that there's special interest groups out there. And none of us want to see anybody influence any election inappropriately. Um, and some have made the comment, you know, show us the proof where there's problems. That's a fair comment. Um, but other than last year, we've never gone down this path either. And a lot of what we do here is try to anticipate and make sure that we don't have those problems. Um, I've heard a lot about signature verification, and I recognize it's a very heavy lift for us. But I also recognize that other states have put safeguards in place um, for a lot of valid reasons, I would hope. And I guess you know, to the 97% that we haven't had issues, maybe the safeguards have, have been a contributing factor to that. So if we were able to put in some language that would limit the number of ballots anybody could bring back in, and I consider myself neighborly, but I'm not sure that there's even 10 people that would allow me to do that, um, where we can make sure that special interest groups, again, regardless of their persuasion, um, can't interject themselves and have an undue influence on things, um, that would alleviate some concerns that I would have around this particular legislation that I think that maybe we could move it along. Uh, Chris Winters has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and with, with much respect to, to all the members of this committee, um, I, I, and especially to Representative LeClaire, I was going to say, the, you know, the solution in, in search of a cure. No, the solution in search of a problem um, is, is something that keeps coming to mind. I, I would understand. I have these same concerns. We have had these same concerns. They would be much greater if we hadn't been forced, as Director Senning said earlier, 
to jump into vote by mail in 2020 and have that year under our belts and have that experience under our belts. And, and something that Will has, has continually drilled into us, into, into Jim and uh, Secretary Condos and I, as we talk about all these potential ways to move forward, is that we need a Vermont-based solution. It's different from state to state. We are not North Carolina. We are not the city of Chicago. This is Vermont, and uh, this uh, born and raised Vermonter may seem a little bit naive here, but I don't think we're gonna see ballot harvesting or widespread voter fraud here in the state. Our towns are small enough. Our clerks know their voters well enough. We will hear about it if there's something like ballot harvesting going on. Um, so I just think this is a, is, is a solution in search of a problem. And until we see it happening, uh, I understand the fear that it could happen in the future, uh, but it's unnecessarily complicating what is a, is a great first step forward for vote by mail for the state of Vermont. Uh, Rep. Hofsky. I had a question of clarification around a special interest group and what would be considered a special interest group. And I will frame where my concern comes from and it comes from the disability community. Would we consider um, if Vermont Center for Independent Living had an advocate counselor helping, an helping a group of individuals they support often, I used to work there, their caseloads are usually around 30 to take their ballots in, is that would that be considered a special interest group? Or if we had someone who was working in a rehab facility who said, hey, I'll help you by taking your ballot in, would that be considered a special interest? So I'm, I'm curious about what one would consider a special interest group. Rep Lafave. Um, thank you for that question. I, I go back to the same position. Not more than one person can bring in 10 ballots. At rehab facilities, they usually have a mailing center. Um, I know when I work at the hospital, patients, so patients could have mail go in and out. They bring it to the front desk. They put it in the out thing, and um, it goes to the mailing center. There's ways to post, you know, to bring mail. Um, and um, it's thinking, thinking of your the other case ones, you know, if they're going into people, um, I, I wouldn't consider those people. I'm talking more of, a, of, of larger unions in, in, in specific special interest groups. So the ones that I'm trying to prevent from, you know, I'm not trying to prevent someone from helping out, a, you know, disabled or elderly person. Um, I will get back to you on what my specific list would look like, but to the testimony from Mr. Winters, um, I think COVID was our preventative measure for ballot harvesting. Uh, no one was going door to door in 2020. Um, hopefully COVID's not around in 2022. Uh, I think more people were worried about um, having someone scream at them for approaching their front door than they were about trying to pull in, uh, you know, or help with a ballot. Um, I think, again, it's really hard to, um, to compare what we are doing and maybe if we are hearing that you guys were thrown into this and you wanted to put more work, then maybe this isn't ready for prime time if, if we're having a hard time putting safeguards in. I'm not saying that uh, voter signatures are the stop all end all. I've offered for other solutions to come forward. I've offered to hear what you all have felt are um, appropriate measures to do. And I'm offering one here, um, just something to help ease my concern. I'm clearly, I'm, I'm not afraid to say that I have concerns. And again, it's preventing um, preventing a problem. Not, I'm not saying that there is one here now. You've shown me that data, but again, there's many things you've also shown me um, to the tune of, you know, we've been in a pandemic, we've had problems, and we're rolling out something that has been live for one year. Um, so I'm, I'm asking just to, for, and I'm thankful that people are considering this and asking questions about it. Um, so thank you. Rep. Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, you know, it's almost getting to the point where it's an allegation looking for a problem. Um, I've been a president of one of the largest unions in the state and been active for 30 years, and I've never been asked to do anything with a ballot. I suspect I would be the poster boy if that were happening here. And also, I have a, the honor of being in a, a district that has two people in it. So when people come to the polls, there are a lot of them. And aside from the 
90 year old person who has picked up the ballot from the next door neighbor who is 95 and can't drive anymore uh, in the old age home that's up the street, I very rarely see anybody with more than one ballot in their hand. And quite frankly, the ballots are large enough, they don't fit in your pocket very well. So when you get out of the car, you're usually holding it. Um, I, I kind of wonder if Carol has any information on the number of people that show up at the, the polls with more than one ballot. It certainly seems like something, if, if there were evidence, I would be supportive of this. There seems to be no evidence, so therefore I am not. Thank you. Carol, thank you. Yeah. Um, the you know, Barry City um, is actually fairly large with regards to Vermont communities, and my voter checklist is over 6,000. Um, but I can tell you, I know pretty much to a person who's going to come with stacks of ballots. And if I don't see Jean from the Parkside neighborhood the week before the election with six or eight ballots from her neighbors, then I begin to wonder if Jean is okay. And, you know, we've got other such um, people around the, the community who, who provide that service for, um, for their neighbors. Um, and I, you know, certainly would want to make sure that that uh, continues to be um, something that that they can do. I think that that's that's important for for uh, people to feel part of the community by being able to offer that. And, and Madam Chair, I think that the greatest preventative factor for ballot harvesting is the fact that everybody has a mailbox on their house, and. Everybody has the option of sending theirs back in pretty much. Unless you elect to have a post office box, then you go to the post office. Thank you. So Carol, if Jean from the <laughs> neighborhood came back with 11, ballot envelopes after we had accepted this restriction, how would you enforce that? Well, um, first of all, one of the things, the, the, the draft language that currently exists in the bill um, it says that, that clerks aren't responsible for, for enforcing it because, you know, what if she brought two in one week and four in the next week and then five in the following week and now she's over the 10 and I, don't feel that as a clerk, I would need to track that number. Somebody had mentioned earlier, you know, punch cards or things like that. Um, I, if if it were an instance, if the if the language said that that ten was the limit, what I would do the first time Jean came in with eleven of them is I would explain to her what the situation is, and um, I would likely accept them that first time, and I would tell her that that going forward, you know, she should partner with one of the other neighbors and and split the duties between them. And then she would feel bad because she would have been told by her town clerk that she was doing something wrong. Um, Chris Winters, your hand is still up. I wanna make sure that you're able to talk if you had wanted to. No, All thank right. you. that was from before. Thank you. Um, so committee, I'm gonna let us take a bio break. Um, hoping that five minutes is enough for you to um, stretch and grab a fresh glass of water and um, and we will come back to do some final work on the bill in after a brief.